So for those of you who don't know me, my name is Carolyn Hutter. I'm the division director for the Division of Genome Sciences in our extramural program here at NHGRI. And I'm here to welcome you to this meeting. So one of the things Xander and I were talking about is we've got some international people here and maybe some people. And so I thought I'd just do the one minute. What is NIH? Welcoming you to NIH. Although you're not on our main campus, you're sort of in one of our satellite spaces. We're really excited to have all of you here in Bethesda. And I was just discussing with Nancy how nice it is that we're all able to gather together again. So NIH's mission is to look into fundamental knowledge about nature and behavior of living systems and how do we apply that knowledge to enhance health, lengthening of life, and reducing illness and disability. For those of you who like nerd out over mission statements, NIH is actually making some changes to its, its mission statement. And if you follow this link, you can provide input on what you think of the revised mission statement. So at a broader sense, NIH is obviously one of the major funders of biomedical research. It is a major funder in the US and worldwide. Um, the 2023 budget was 47.7 billion. I do not know what the 2024 budget will be, but I'm happy to report that we will not be shutting down on Saturday. Um, so, so we do, um, it's, we comprise of 27 different institutes and centers. Um, this graph here shows the size of the centers by their congressional appropriations. I don't expect you to read the small lines. The top three are NCI or the Cancer Institute, NIAID, Allergy and Infectious Disease, and NHLBI, Heart, Lung, and Blood. Down at the bottom, you have um, the Fogarty International Center. And NHGRI, or the National Human Genome Research Institute, who where I am, is sort of there. We debate whether we're the, one of the smallest of the medium-sized institutes or largest of the smaller institutes. But across all of the institutes and centers of the you know, almost $50 billion, 80% is awarded out through competitive grants, contracts, cooperative agreements, et cetera, to fund biomedical research. And we fund over 300,000 researchers in every US state around the world. About 10% supports scientists in NIH labs, which we call you know, sort of NIH intramural. And then the difference, the remaining is sort of supports infrastructure, some salaries, those types of keeping the buildings open. I also had meant to notice in this, um, if you go up a little bit from us right here, you have NICHD, the Child Health Institute. They are the people who have graciously given us their space for today and also are providing some A, A, B support. So thank you to them. And I heard some people were wondering, you have to go through security when there's enough federal employees working in a specific building. So this building used to not have security and then all of us moved in upstairs and tipped it over, not because they're all, they, all of us program, but just the number of people. So focusing in on NHGRI, as an institute, our vision is to improve the health of all humans through advances in genomic research. And we're really driven right now as an institute by our 2020 strategic vision published here in Nature. As you <clears throat> break down that vision, we really sort of divided our activity into a number of areas, starting with guiding principles and values that should underlie everything we do, the need to build and sustain a robust foundation for genomics, the idea that if we're gonna push things forward, we need to start with a solid base. The idea of breaking down barriers, what are clear, op what are clear obstacles or things standing in the way that we need to get past to move forward. And then the development of compelling genomics research projects. Most relevant to this meeting today, if we zoom in on these compelling genomics research projects, there's a number of them listed here, and I'm just gonna call out one, um, which is the need to determine the genetic architecture of most human diseases and traits. And so if you wanna read more about our strategic plan in general or about this particular thing, you can go to the um, website, put in NHGRI strategic vision, you'll get 2020, you'll get the document. But it's really this idea that the field right now is poised to have a much more comprehensive understanding of the genetic architecture of human diseases and traits. And we need to be in a position where we're understanding the myriads of complexities 
that we anticipate and maybe some that we don't un anticipate underlying that. As we outlined in the strategic plan, strategic vision, one of the things that's needed is new methods that account for human diversity, coupled with growing clarity about genotype phenotype relationships and innovative approaches to deduce associations, interactions with environmental factors, estimation of penetrance and expressivity, et cetera. And so what we've been doing since we sort of developed the plan in 2020 is understanding how can we move forward with some of these different components. And so in this particular place, you're all here today, sorry about the graphics, for part of today's workshop. And we really see this as helping us sort of map out and understand what types of activities should we be doing as we think about how to tackle that particular compelling genomics research project. So as I welcome you today, I invite you all to participate in this meeting, actively listen to one another, commit to having this be a safe and open environment. More importantly for me, ask the hard questions. Think about what you need to do to facilitate the interdisciplinary interactions for this amazing group of people who are here in this room and provide input to us at NHGRI and to each other for ideas that you may have for investigator initiated research, et cetera, on what are these key gaps and opportunities and how do we advance this framework? So with that as my introduction, I'm gonna turn it over to the real driving person behind today's meeting, Xander, and he's gonna go over some logistics. And again, I welcome you all to Bethesda, to our NICHD conference room, to this NHGRI meeting and to NIH. Thank you. Thanks everyone for joining us. I just wanna say a brief words more specifically about the scientific context um, of the meeting. As you'll notice through the program, one of the sort of the major themes of today's and tomorrow's workshop is one of biological levels of organization. Um, and so, you know, thinking back into the history of quantitative genetics, we sort of started with many sort of organismal level traits in terms of understanding genetic influences. But more recently, we've had a lot of data being generated at lower levels of molecular cellular features. Um, somebody's phone's up here. <laughs> um, and so we have a lot of data being generated uh, using new sequencing technologies of these molecular level assays, but we're also getting a lot more phenotypic data on these large cohorts um, that we also have genetic information for. Um, so, so one of the idea is, can we use the same sort of theories and models that we developed um, early in quantitative genetics and apply this to lower sub-organismal traits as well as supra-organismal traits? And by supra-organismal, these are traits that are still measured for the individual, but it's the individual in the context of their larger social ecological environment and how these sort of quantitative genetic models apply across these levels and can we integrate across this, these levels? So that's sort of one of the major motivating factors, right? We have all this data can we make sense of it all using the same sort of theoretical conceptual frameworks? So we did a little bit crowdsourcing and planning for this meeting. We asked all of you to provide what you thought were some outstanding or interesting questions in different areas of uh, genetics. And sort of one of the cross-cutting themes that we noticed in many of your responses, uh, one is that you know we're collecting all these data, but we're thinking about traits that are mostly static, like cell states, cell types. Even now we're getting into cell context but how can we incorporate more dynamic processes um, into understanding genetic effects and dynamic process meaning sort of across uh, development and across evolutionary histories? How can we incorporate these changing processes and understanding genetic effects? So something to think about as we're discussing everything and across the next two days. Uh, another thing we noticed is that uh, many times our observations, our data can be consistent with many different types of models but how can we distinguish uh, which one of those models uh, is correct? Um, and we can take different approaches as we start refining our models, or we can generate more data to distinguish among competing uh, models. And that's something, again, to consider as we're discussing various topics, uh, the balance between do we need to update our theories and our, our models, or do we just need uh, uh, better data? Uh, and you know, uh, related to that, we do have a couple of funding opportunities available now these are for R21s and R01s that are mostly uh, looking for new theories and methods development um, in the area of complex trait genetic architecture. 
Uh, so the links for these will be in the meeting booklet in which uh, you can scan some of the QR codes and find that meeting booklet. And these have standard receipt dates and IH receipt dates, the first one being in February. And if you have any questions about these funding opportunities, please um, uh, let me know. Uh, some final words again about uh, levels of organization. One thing sort of I've noticed in watching many discussions in human genetics and other areas is many people often times speak past each other or many disagreements are really having to do with the fact that many people are approaching the question from different levels of analysis, right? Um, so, and they often see their particular level of analysis as privileged uh, among the others. Um, so a lot of disagreements happen this way. And for biomedical researchers especially, we have the tendency to look downward in terms of explanation, right? So when we're looking for a mechanism, it's usually turtles all the way down but it's rarely ever turtles all the way up. Um, so when we're thinking about how we come up with mechanisms and explanations, you know, we often look at lower levels, but oftentimes we can look at higher levels as well. And so one of the, the hopes of this meeting is trying to see if, you know, we can all come to an understanding in terms of a common framework um, to work from so that no matter what your entry point is, no matter what vantage point you take up, whatever level of biological organization, we're all basically standing on the same turtle. So something to think about as we go forward. Um, so some, some quick housekeeping. Uh, if you ordered lunch, uh, they'll be available at 12.30. It'll be on your own. You can eat wherever you like. If you didn't get a lunch, there's a cafe just a few minutes walk from here where they have hot and cold sandwiches as well as a, a, a food bar. Uh, in terms of uh, sort of Zoom, so everyone received a panelist link on Zoom. So if you want, you can log in while you're at the meeting. If you're in person, please do not connect to the audio, disconnect the audio so we won't get any feedback issues. Uh, the advantage of you logging in while you're at the meeting is you can engage with questions in the Q&A. So if you see a question that particularly interests you, then you can respond to it uh, 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 online. Uh, if you're a virtual participant, um, just raise your hand um, and turn on your camera so that we can call on you uh, during the sessions. Um, and the webinar participants, you have access to the Q&A function, so you can enter all your questions. We'll try to get to as many Q&As we get from webinar participants as we can. If you don't get to them, hopefully we can address them online. Um, and now I'll be happy to introduce our first uh, speaker, which I don't know, oh, there he is. Uh, uh, <laughs> Aravinda Chakravarti will be giving the first keynote on sort of broad picture um, overview of genetic architecture it's from the Center for Human Genetics and Genomics at NYU. Okay. Thank you. Otherwise, you're in hearing distance. Okay. All right. Good morning. Um, I um, I hope this doesn't presage what's going to happen over the next day and a half. So things would go far more smoothly. So um, let me begin by first congratulation, uh, congratulating the organizers for inviting me. Um, uh, this is only one of very few conferences, large conferences I've attended since COVID. And it's really great to see many old friends as well as meet many other new ones whose works I've only uh, read about. So I'm gonna, I was asked and tasked really to do a historical overview of genetic architecture. Any kind of historical view is fraught with all kinds of problems. You may disagree with my omissions, with my inclusions and my inferences, but we can sort this out in discussions throughout this meeting. And I'm gonna speak about really two twin ideas. And the twin ideas have to do with mapping, which has really been a central core of genetics since its inception, uh, mapping in many ways. And then the idea is that the purpose of that is, of course, to understand the causal factors and mechanism. And as I will outline, this has again been from the very beginnings of genetics. So this is just a Gedanken experiment. I'm sure most of us have thought about it and sample size is intrinsic to many of our discussions. And But so it's sampling in whom we study. But to me, at least, uh, at first glance, the answer to this is no, because we have become very good in finding associations. And the hard task that remains is to identify causality. And this has been far more difficult than we had imagined. 
So it's useful to begin with uh, the definition of uh, genetic architecture. There's a great article by Trudy McKay in 2000 in the annual reviews of genetics. You can go back and refer, but this, I think for some of us, or some of us who remember that far back, uh, is that there was this meeting that was hosted, organized by Irene Ekstrand, who was a program officer at NIGMS here at the NIH. And this meeting was called the Genetic Architecture Complex Traits. It's way back, way back, even before the genome was sequenced, where we were trying to view what the future may look like. I think Nancy Cox may have been uh, the only other member I think here, uh, given our ages, who was at this meeting. And there are really two things to think about. The first paragraph you can read as a simple definition of all of the kind of parts and details we would like to know. But the second was an important observation uh, of this meeting that the genetic architecture is a moving target. It's not the same for all populations, it's not the same for all time, simply because of evolutionary forces. And in genetics, we always have to remember the proximal causes as well as distal causes. And the distal causes are almost all evolution. So it's useful to begin with Gregor Mandel. Uh, we don't know, of course, his primary work and primal work on figuring out the rules of inheritance. But Mendel's early work uh, in peas were actually contrary to observations of many similar breeding experiments. The many other experiments perhaps shouldn't be called experiments because they were not scientifically designed, but nevertheless. And the threes to one segregation ratio and independence was contrary to many of the other experiments that Mendel did with many other plants. Peas were not the only thing that he studied. And I think it was his genius to understand the fundamental nature of that observations and recognize that there were exceptions. And I believe at least the, my interpretation is it really, he happened to have strains that had some kind of genetic variation that he could isolate the effects of a major gene. That it, in other words, polygenic variation was low. And you can read more about it in his biography. But together with the rediscovery of Mendelism in uh, 2000, I'm sorry, in 1900. Um, by the way, I don't have a timer here, so hopefully somebody will tell me uh, that uh, inheritance were, had as many exceptions as there were rules. And the first experiment of the first geneticist to point this out was Johansson, who took a number of seeds and he measured their weight and it had the much more usual kind of normal distribution, but he could self-fertilize uh, plants from individual seeds and showed they had much more restricted variation. And thus began this debate as to what the nature of genetic variation underlying phenotypes were. There were other studies by Yule who went back and looked back, uh, who went and reanalyzed Mendel's own data on white and purple crosses, talking about gradations and not this yes, no phenotype that Mendel interpreted. And then some very beautiful work in, in, in wheat, in, in grain color in wheat that clearly showed that there was strong epistasis between a number of factors, not call epistasis then, that could lead to, for a single pair, threes to one segregation, but with more genes and some traits. In this case, 15 is to one or 63 is to one, which we now recognize and all undergraduates learn. But to me, the definitive experiment was this, and this study, Altenberg and Mullers. This was, by the way, Brian Charlesworth pointed this paper out to me, I think now close to 30 years ago, that uh, this was the first study in which a trait that was difficult uh, in there was refractory to Mendelian analysis was analyzed into three distinct gene pairs. They could even show that the one on the X chromosome was not the sex determining factor. And Muller in particular, I think, because it's been written historically, was a person who recognized that this way of analysis using visible markers in their case Markers that Mendelize, nevertheless, using linked identifying factors could be generally used, could be used in humans. And in the last occur, and the last paragraph defines their features. This, by the way, is what all genetic variants that we use now are. So they gave a way of the analysis using linkage, but of course, this carries over to association as well, as I will tell. So this period was in fact fraught with a lot of debate. Of course, the protagonists we know are Pearson Galton on one side and William Bateson on the other. 
And apparently, many in fact write, that Ronald Fisher's work in 1918 was probably the first one that showed how multifactorial inheritance or quantitative inheritance was compatible with Mendel's rules. But of course, these kinds of thinking, as I showed you earlier on earlier slides, already existed in genetics, but there were still many other questions as to whether this variation observed was only genetic or whether it was environmental, the magnitude of the variation. And however, Fisher's statistical model wasn't a molecular genetic model that was, has been very useful in many, many circumstances. But there are other ways of viewing Mendelizing traits. And this is one from function. So this is from 1908, even earlier, Archibald Garrard in London was studying a phenotype that really puzzled him called alcaptonuria. And he first showed with the help of Bateson that this was autosomal recessive. So this was the first disease gene really thought to be Mendelian. And he did something else. His analysis of this alcaptonuric urine introduced to him the idea that human beings, as he was a physician, uh, had inborn errors of metabolism. And he thought that diseases were the result of missing of false steps in the body's chemical pathways leading to chemical individuality. I think the full idea of genetic individuality hadn't quite set, but in his mind, genetic individuality translated into this chemical individuality, which was the basis of disease. The function was, true function, biochemical function, was figured out a few decades later. I'm gonna take a strong leap from there. There's a lot of history in between, but at least me as a human geneticist, I find the next set of events that are quite important are the work of these three individuals. Many of you know, it's Jim Neal, Victor Mikusik, and Arno Matalski in the late 1950s in establishing three departments of human genetics and medical genetics in Ann Arbor, in Baltimore, and in Seattle, respectively. But beyond making the study of genetics in human disease important, by their own examples and work clinically important, they did two things. They medicalized human genetics with all of the consequences that we see today, including our funding. Secondly, he made the point that geneticists could now take their place in medicine because geneticists had their own organ, just like the nephrologists have the kidney, and of course the organ is the genome, which we all believe. But the other thing that these three geneticists did was to make an intense search for pathophysiology. As physicians, they wanted to know the causes of disease, not merely inheritance. Of course, a lot of it was on establishing modes of inheritance. You would think that speaking about recessive or dominant inheritance would be simple, but human beings have small families, their ascertainment biases, and classical methods of segregation analysis, starting from Wilhelm Weinberg, of Hardy Weinberg fame could be used to try and sort out what the inheritance was. But this is not the only thing that they did. They established cytogenetics as a discipline within medical genetics. They pioneered many of the biochemical assays of metabolites and serum proteins and enzymes that led to defects found not only in patient, but in patient fibroblast cultures. And these mechanisms led to the treatment of many inborn errors treatments that are used till today, but often in many other ways. And they understood that the mapping part was intrinsic to uh, have a route into unbiased pathophysiology. And of course, a grand example was that of uh, first Joe Goldstein and then Mike Brown in figuring out the role of the LDL receptor in heart attacks and more specifically in familial hypercholesterolemia. All of you know the story. I'm not going to go into the detail. But they started on the top left with epidemiological studies of survivors of heart attacks in Boeing in Seattle. Um, Joe Goldstein was a clinical fellow with Arno Motulski, and that led to eventually studies of families, exceptional families that segregated a disorder, finding rare homozygous patients that led to isolation of the defect in fibroblast cultures that later came together with Endo's discovery of statins to show that they would be, in fact, an effective, um, effective treatment of this elevation of cholesterol. 
So mechanism was key to understanding that. It's apparent from Joe Goldstein's work and those of Helmut Schrott and many others at that time in Seattle, that the existing statistical models were wanting. They could model major genes, they could find major genes, single genes, if you will, but that they required the effect of other genetic backgrounds, um, essentially that of polygenes. And that led to the emergence of a whole host of statistical models, then called the mixed model that had the effects of major genes as well as a polygenic background, provisions for all other kinds of genetic phenomena that were known to be important. And this is what led to the mapping of major gene effects with the recognition that there were other genetic factors. And a lot of studies by Newton Morton and his colleagues, Robert Elston and his colleague and Jörg Ott made the time in the early 1970s important and interesting because that's the first time we could do linkage studies in large scale using at that point in time, serum protein and enzyme markers. Again, a leap. And the leap was the finding of human non-coding variation. Till that time, almost every variant that we have had were assayable in serum or plasma by electrophoresis. Many of you know the fly literature um, that did very similar kinds of studies and in blood groups. And there was no general way of studying all proteins or including the rest of the DNA. We knew that the genome was large. And of course there was debate on the number of genes. So YW Khan's work with Andre Doji was the first, with the beta globin gene was the first human gene clone, was important in recognizing that there were polymorphisms in DNA, not a surprise, but that these polymorphisms could be used to track the effects of genetic mutations, well-known mutations like the sickle mutation. And in 1978, there was a classic paper. To me, this is the first recognition of a DNA polymorphism. And it did some other thing that many of you will recognize that it made an association, a population level association between a specific genetic marker and a disease. And that led to our thinking that we could now invert it. That is, we could use arbitrary genetic markers, we could clone and lead to the identification of the disease gene. And this is really largely the work and a collaborative work with Lap Chi Choi, who was really the hero in the positional cloning and in the identification of CFTR and this major mutation, Delta 508, work that he did with Francis Collins. And what I'm showing you is a very crude attempt at making a map of RFLPs. This was incredibly difficult that lab she did. And essentially we used the principle of linkage to equilibrium in this region of several megabases to try and find the mutation. And on the back is our rendition of the ancestral chromosome that existed in patients pointing to a disease location. But the history of this kind of association tests in human genetics is not recent. It's gone on for a very long time. Ever since studies in the 1950s showing the relationship, these were direct association studies taking functional variants like the ABO locus and showing its relationship to peptic ulcers. The statistical findings around that is actually very interesting. There are positive findings, there are false positive findings because of structure and then statistical methods to remove them. And there were many other studies, of course, of which the most successful were HLA associations in autoimmune disease, pioneered mostly really by Walter Bodmer and his colleagues. The DNA polymorphisms initially were used as, as functional probes, but pretty soon it was obvious that they were indirect probes. I spoke about the work on beta globin, but this was very quickly used to identify haplotypes in different patients that differed and likely carried different mutations work that Hey Kazazian and Stu Orkin did. And it is that work that led to broadly again suggesting that linkage to separate mapping was important. And this became feasible once the scale of LD for the human genome was figured out. And there's a number of individuals, Mark Daly, my group and others did studies. And of course, uh, David Altshore and others in 2000 did this on a much larger scale across the genome. It's not only restricted to qualitative traits. There were studies on quantitative traits. 
Harry Harris's work in 1964 clearly shows the relationship between acid phosphatase and its structural variants, meaning its protein variants and its activity. But of course, the heyday of it started with studies in multiple organisms, including humans in the early 2000s of looking at gene expression as a phenotype. So I think there was a lot of precedence to think that genome-wide association studies would be a natural progression. And uh, there's a review, very nice review of genetic uh, approaches to mapping by Eric Lander and Nick Shork in 1994. But I find genome-wide studies in particular largely is very clearly stated by Neil Risch and Kathy Mary Kangas in 1996. And you can read the quote that makes it quite clear that large-scale testing was necessary. So what were the impediments? And there were two major impediments. One is population geneticists knew that human population structure could be an impediment. And this, of course, was the reason why many past studies hadn't succeeded. And the second was the ability to genotype what we knew were at least hundreds of thousands of markers. And the development initially by Affymetrics and later by Illumina of making a single tube assay where you could assay 100,000 or even a million markers was really the bottleneck that overcame, uh, was really the bottleneck we had to overcome to do genome-wide association studies that are so widespread today. I do have one of these original cartridges and it has 200 SNPs and I have three exclamation points. We could do 200 in one assay. So a million was really great. So what have GWASs taught us? And I think we're gonna talk about this throughout the meeting. It really did solidify that Fisher's infinitesimal model was correct, at least for multifactorial inheritance. But newly, it did emphasize uh, the importance of the non-coding genome and the ubiquity of small genetic effects in trained biology. I don't know that we fully understood the magnitude and the meaning of it, and that's really quite important. But there are other features to it. I think Jonathan Pritchard is quite eloquently described an omnigenic model that we have to face and answer the attendant questions with. And, uh, but I also recognize that there's a lot of uh, dispute over that model, that we need to bring the data to it. But it's turned out that implicating specific variants, genes and pathways on the mapping side has become much better, but on the functional side, this has been, success has been far more halting. And understanding disease mechanisms has been even more difficult. I think we need to answer, why do these genes cause this phenotype of this disease? How do, I, to me, an important question is, how do cells and tissues count the mutational load? How does a cell in the diabetic kidney know that it has a hundred risk-causing variants rather than three? And Mechanisms for that and mechanisms how phenotypic differences lead to disease are important to unravel. So much of my view, we do study what you would call truly complex traits, such as cardiovascular disease uh, of various sorts, but almost all of complex genetics that I've learned has been through this model example of Hirschsprung's disease. I'm not gonna tell you much, the disorder of intestinal motility where kids are born without that gut being innervated. And uh, there are many features of this that I've described here. But the question is, what is it that we learned? We learned about many, many genes. We clearly now know of at least 38 genes that have multiple statistically significant variants, pathogenic variants that lead to disease. We have at least three genes that have multiple enhancers with variants that are statistically associated in the population. We can explain about 63% of the attributable risk, mostly as you can imagine from the common variants, but that's quite a bit. But the important lessons is that almost all of the genes that we know, not all, they are functionally united into a single gene regulatory network. And we know that that network controls the expression of two key genes, RET, and EDNRB, they're two different receptors, kinds of receptors, and they do so specifically in enteric neuropress cells. So we know that RET and EDNRB are rate limiting because you could have mutations within these genes 
outside these genes and the enhancers or in trans factors or other interacting molecules. And they always change the expression of RET and EDNRB. And I think finding such rate limiting steps in a giant network is important. We know now from mouse models recreating these or modeling this, that Hirschsprung's arises from a disrupted two kinds of both autonomous and non-cell autonomous interactions between these enteric neural crest cell precursors and the gut mesenchyme. And because we know the mechanism, we know the time of development, the kind of cell and the network, we can predict many other genes in which we can find pathogenic mutations, not in all of them, because that depends on the mutation structure of the gene, but uh, we do. And in fact, if any of you are interested, there's a very strong association between Hirschsprung and trisomy 21. We are now being able to explain how that comes about. So I'm gonna end by saying, we become very good in defining genetic individuality. And in Garrett's work, words, we got to define the chemical individuality if we are to understand disease much better. So there are many kinds of cellular mechanisms that can be affected by multigenic components. I think Jonathan's omnigenic model is the first line, but there are many other things that happen. So the words that I've used in yellow to describe this was suggested by Nancy, not in any one particular conversation, is to say, what are the known unknowns? Well, the known unknowns are the regulatory networks. By the way, this is regulatory networks in the Eric Davidson sense, which I can explain later. But ultimately, these have to alter some cellular phenotype. It could be tissue composition. It could be proliferation, as it is in Hirschsprung's, or apoptosis, or cell metabolism. And we have to be able to understand that to know the relationship between variants and genes and how they change a phenotype. One of the things to remember is increasingly it's obvious from both the genetics and other literature that protein complex dosage is a rate limiting step of many cell behaviors, particularly because of proteostasis. The synthesis folding and degradation of proteins and their rates, these can be interrupted in a generic way by many kinds of specific gene action and cellular stress often results. So how the disease comes about may invoke nothing specific to those genes, but far more generic pathways. But of course, there are many unknowns. I think we, in many ways, still live in a world that Haldane first described in this famous debate with Ernst Meyer in Cold Spring Harbor called a defense of beanbag genetics. I think we still live in his world. As which is that we look at the genome one gene at a time, but the genome is hardly that. We know this from many studies of evolution. And so we do need to consider a much more systems response and that's much more easily said than done. So I wanna thank you for your attention and giving me this opportunity. I can answer questions throughout the meeting or now if there's time, but I wanna particularly thank Nancy and Molly for helping me think through some of these issues. Thanks. I saw on the Q&A someone asked if you could comment on sort of the reverse step forward approach to genetics. Um, yeah, so I think, I think we need both. I, do, I think it's obvious we need both. When we know nothing about the specific genes or the biology, then of course reverse is the only approach that we have. And, and genetic mapping is one of a wonderful sort of really reverse approach. I'm often awed by the power that it has. It reveals us things we don't understand, but it does reveal, um, reveal things. I think increasingly as we understand more about genes, pathways, then I think using a forward approach becomes far more compelling. And I think I see inklings of it in the work of many. And so I, I don't think there's a choice in one or the other. 
So I, I think um, the way in which genetics, so the question was, if, if you couldn't hear Michael Gardard, is that uh, epistasis appears to be far more important, but when we detect, we don't see much of it. Uh, number one, I think epistasis being important depends on the scale at which we work. There is not one scale for the phenotype. And epistasis may be far more important, it's like penetrance. It may be far more important on one scale than another. But I think the definition, I ended by saying we need a systems approach. A systems approach essentially concedes that most things interact with one another. Now, whether we statistically detect it or not, maybe because of the design of the experiment, power, and many other things. I pointed out the two receptors, RET and EDNRB. They're two very different. It's a receptor kerosene kinase and a, and a serpentine receptor, but they're very strongly epistatic. They're very, very strongly epistatic. And we've been able to measure that epistasis in two very special circumstances. In mice, when you knock out the genes, or even with hypomorphs, or in a particular isolate we study, which is the old order Mennonites, because there they have a rare variant. So there are lots of enhancers, lots of common variants in RET, almost none in EDNRB. I, that's what evolution gave us. Uh, in this case, but there is a rare mutation in EDNRB that's very common among Mennonites. So in that case, we can show epistasis quite effectively. Greg. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I sort of, um, I guess it's uh, sort of like my food habits. I not only eat Indian food, but almost anything that's, that's not anything that's edible, but almost anything that is really wonderful. So I think all model organisms have uh, their value. You know, our journey into Hirschman's disease started because um, I, anyway, I sat on a student's defense and she was describing all these pedigrees and I was surprised that that behavior was quite distinct from models that were already known in the literature. There were mouse models, a rat model, and there's even a horse model called white fold syndrome. So, and they were almost all Mendelian because they were all um, associated with pigmentary anomalies. And humans had bed them because of those pigmentary anomalies. So, I think model organisms have different lessons to teach us, but they're very important. In this case, it told us the cell type. It told us it had to be pigment, it had to be a neuropress origin because it's in the gut. So I'm, from, I'm for getting data from any place that you can. Um, I think the exact model organism, I don't think you should stick to only flies and mice or C. elegans. It depends on the question that you're answering, and all kinds of new model systems. One last question. So, uh, is it on? Sorry. So, uh, Bruce Walsh, uh, I actually was also with Nancy at that original meeting. It's amazing how wrong we were uh, uh, collectively. But I want to say that an important model organism that people overlook, which I think has the next best GWAS outside of humans, is maize. The nested association mapping. Uh, right. designs and maize are incredibly yeah. powerful because they've got unique genotypes you can replicate. So you can look at really tremendous power with G by E and right. get a precise measurement in genotype. And the net conclusions from that are very much the same we see with humans. Our, you know, rare effects tend to be large but rare. Um, and also most of the variations is being in non-coding regions. So I think we need to go even beyond kind of animal model systems to give us deep questions about architecture. <laughs> Um, yeah, thank you, Bruce. I'm, I'm, uh, I think um, um, I'm seeing you after decades, so, so pardon me if I didn't recognize you in the morning. That I, I, um, I have age as an excuse, but, but um, I, I, I completely agree with you. I think there are two kinds of inferences we need to make. I think we need to understand the nature of a genetic system that can lead to phenotypic variation, and we can learn that and if we should learn that from a whole variety of systems. But I think we do have an obligation and really a great scientific interest in doing this for specific human phenotypes and disease. 
if not for anything else, it's the most widely, you know, is 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 the organism that's completely outbred that we can study in its sort of natural habitat, so to speak. So when we do it for a specific instance, we need to be able to invoke all of those kinds of mechanisms to be able to do it. But I, I agree with you with that. Okay. Okay, thank you. So uh, we'll start our first session, uh, which will be chaired by Shamil Sunya from Harvard. Let's continue. It's actually humbling to stand here after Ravinda Chakravarti and after being reminded about many, many years of genetic research that brought us here. Uh, so I'd like to welcome you to the first session uh, where we'll have its, its titled Cells, Tissues, and Organs. We have three amazing speakers, uh, Tulila Polainen from uh, KTH Royal Institute of Technology, Nasa Sinat Armstrong from Fred Heitch, and Francesca Luca from Wayne State. These talks will be followed by a uh, discussion chaired by Barbara Stranger, and we have a set of panelists. And uh, we suggest that these are the questions that would feed into the discussion in addition to the talks. And as you see, the first question uh, revolves around this idea of context for individual cell, cell trajectory, developmental stage, cell type, cell state, because uh, there is a lot of realization that genetic effect manifests itself in a given cell in a given time uh, and state. The second question is about transforming this cell effects into larger systematic units, not the whole organism yet, but tissues, organs, and so forth. And then the third question, uh, we reflect the belief that the way we're thinking about this moving target of uh, analytic architecture is defined by evolutionary biology. And I decided that I'm not going to quote Dabzhansky because everybody does and we should avoid this at least once. So going forward, I'd like to state very simple questions, which I believe are three primary questions for the field. And in my opinion, are the major questions in life sciences today. First, we have this non-coding variation that uh, Aravinda just described. And we have no idea, in my opinion at least, about the proximal functions, what these variants do, the variants we call regulatory. Uh, so what are the mechanisms underlying the function? Do we have the right molecular and the phenotype we can collect and analyze? Is it bulk gene expression, single cell expression? Some change in response to stimulus, maybe rate of transcription, maybe, maybe we, we know that rate of transcription should be mediator for many of this or splicing, but what's happening at the molecular level. So this is, this is a big question. And uh, again, context dependency, right? So as, as we discussed at the first prompt, all these effects manifest themselves in a given cell, not in the vacuum. The second question is um, how the collective action of numerous variants translate into phenotypic variation, right? So we have this observation that independent action of multiple uh, small effect variants uh, influence the phenotype. And this is a very unsatisfactory model because you open a biology textbook and biology textbook is filled with specific pathways and networks and mechanisms. It's not independent action of tens of thousands of variants. So the question is, what are these low dimensional biological units uh, and the hierarchy? Are these pathways, networks? Are there some endophenotypes, intermediate phenotypes? Is it core versus periphery? Is this the hierarchy of simple phenotypes feeding into complex phenotypes, or is this some sort of omnigenic mechanism? And again, what's the role of context in this in this story? And the last uh, question is the, uh, why do we see this from evolutionary biology standpoint, right? Because we know that natural selection usually favors specific trait value. We know that monogenic diseases like hypercholesterolemia or diabetes are rare, and we attribute this to to action of natural selection. Uh, however, polygenic forms are quite common. Uh, and even phenotypes that are known epidemiologically to be associated with a fitness loss are relatively common in the population. Uh, and this brings us to, again, the question of evolutionary biology and uh, how this uh, genetic analytic architecture exists in populations. So uh, with, with this, I would like to invite um, Julie.
Uh, I don't know if she, I haven't seen her in person, so I wonder whether she's uh, she's virtual. Uh, it is my pleasure to invite virtual Tule. Uh, so please. Um, is it actually okay if I share my own slides? I made a few last minute uh, edits. All right, I think this works. So it's uh, it's a huge pleasure to uh, join you, uh, even if virtually. I'm very sad that I'm not able to be there in in uh, person, but but it's a, it's a pleasure to kind of follow this uh, Shamil's thoughts and and Aravinda's uh, um, amazing uh, keynote to to discuss the functional uh, functional architecture of genetic variation and 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 complex traits and think and think about how how we characterize these regulatory effects of genetic variance and then how do we move uh, forward from that to think about molecular phenotypes of the cell and and beyond. So we can, of course, think about, um, uh, I'm sorry, can I share my own slides? Do, the, do you see them? You stop by sharing now. Okay, is this okay? Um, all right, so uh, we can think about functional effects of genetic variants, and in particular, the focus here being uh, on regulatory variants across multiple different phenotype levels, as, as uh, the previous speakers already kind of mentioned. So, so uh, we can think about the sort of molecular effects at the levels of epigenome, the kind of chroma, uh, uh, chromatin level effects, transcriptome proteome effects, cells, tissue function, uh, physiological phenotypes, and disease. And there is, of course, a multiple, like a huge number of, of functional variants at the lower phenotypic uh, levels, which don't often have any downstream effects. And this affects the selective constraint that, that these uh, variants are under. And one thing that I want to point out, and I will return to this uh, later, um, a couple of slides from now, is that we have relatively rich data of genetic effects on the kind of lower molecular levels. We also have very rich data on, from GWAS on disease and physiological uh, variant associations, but we have relative sparsity in the middle. There is this kind of like valley of death of trying to understand variant effects on cellular and tissue level uh, functions. But if we first think about the, the cis regulatory effects of, of genetic variants, which dominate uh, the genetic architecture of co complex traits, this is also a question that is actually a, a whole set of questions, where uh, when we have identified our associated loci, first there is the question of what are actually the, the causal functional variants versus their LD proxies, a big question of what are the proximal epigenomic effects of variants, for example, on transcription factor binding and such um, effects enhancer activity, so forth. And then probably the most important single question of what are the target genes in the, in the locus for this non-coding uh, regulatory uh, loci. And then, of course, for all of these, there's the question of what is the relevant cell type or cell state where causal um, disease mediating effects are actually uh, taking place. Um, there is a lot of questions. Luckily, there is uh, multiple approaches as well to tackle the variant to function uh, challenge. And I tend to divide them to three groups. Um, there is the, the, uh, um, the oldest uh, large scale approach of characterizing regulatory variation, which is molecular QTL or EQTL mapping, where you associate genetic variation in a population sample to molecular readouts um, uh, from, those, from those individuals. And then there is uh, somewhat more recently a large scale approach using different types of experimental uh, engineered perturbations uh, of the genome applied to in vitro cellular or other model systems and then, then seeing how that um, affects molecular phenotypes. And then the third approach, which I won't talk about much uh, myself, is something that I call kind of like the ENCODE approach, where you don't actually assess genetic perturbations of any type directly, but you have very rich molecular profiles from different cell types. And then you can use that data to infer putative variant um, effects. So if we think about the first two a little bit, dig, dig a little bit deeper into those, first to the molecular QTL um, uh, um, landscape. 
This is um, a place where um, during the past 10, 15 years, we've created amazingly rich data sets of especially expression QTLs and splicing QTLs, for example, in projects like Chitex, where we now identified tens of thousands of common regulatory variants affecting basically every, every single gene in the human genome across multiple different, different tissues. This is very rich data that has given us a lot of insights into the regulatory architecture of, of genetic variation. But, um, but more recently, there's been um, quite a bit of uh, discussion in the community that, that despite the richness of these, of these catalogs, they have some limitations in capturing the, the GWAS uh, effects that, that many of us are, are actually interested in and that has been uh, driving a lot of this these um, analysis. So just to put a couple of numbers there, uh, EQTLs have been estimated to account for 11% uh, of GWAS heritability. And uh, even when matching autoimmune GWAS traits with relevant immune cell types, uh, uh, EQTLs um, uh, were conf confidently co-localized with just 25% of GWAS loci. So these numbers are not nothing, but it's also not exactly sort of solving the entire question of how should we interpret um, regular um, uh, effects of non-coding GWAS loci. And there is currently a lot of debate in the community whether, whether kind of like, what, what are the conclusions that what should draw from this? Is it, a, is it a question where we should actually kind of just pursue other approaches or whether we should double down on the EQTL approach? And there are indeed um, still um, multiple very, very important gaps in the current EQTL or molecular QTL data that we have. Um, one big caveat is in the cell, lack of cell type, cell state specificity of the associations that we discover um, primarily thus far from bulk samples now with single cells arising as a very important novel data source. There is um, important cell types and cell states, especially uh, thinking about developmental trajectories that uh, bulk tissue EQTLs don't capture very well. Uh, whether the steady state transcriptome is always the right readout is a, is a question. And probably the most sort of principal fundamental um, kind of uh, uh, concern is that uh, molecular QTLs discovered in sort of typical sample sizes of some hundreds of individuals um, are depleted in constrained disease relevant genes because of power issues, basically the, the architecture of the genetic variants that we find in EQTL studies versus Chiwa studies ends up being um, different. However, there is some very interesting recent work that indicates that when we increase the power of EQTL studies, uh, in this example, um, in having a few thousand um, um, uh, samples uh, with adipose data, allows us to discover additional independent EQTLs, increasing in, in, increasingly in the enhancers where GWAS uh, signals um, are as well, and, and, and indications that this this uh, improves um, sort of informative co-localization of results for GWAS by quite a bit. And I think that when we think back to the history of human genetics and then the early history of GWAS, which didn't actually work that well in the beginning when sample sizes were limited, power was limited. And now when people doubled down on that and actually got sufficient power, really amazing uh, insights and, and applications have emerged. That type of experiments have, haven't really been done for, for molecular QTLs yet. We don't have very well powered QTL data with cell state resolution. And I think that this is something that as uh, a study design that, that we may want to uh, pursue uh, as a field. But there is more than EQTLs in the field, um, and many uh, labs, including my own lab, have been pursuing uh, CRISPR tools um, uh, to to understand the effects of of uh, GWAS loci. And for example, in this in this uh, paper from last spring with Nevels and John and John Morris and and others, we um, used CRISPR I to silence GWAS enhancers and then use single cell RNA sequencing as a as a readout to detect. Uh, the effects of, of these uh, GWAS loci in cis and trans, and finding quite a high yield of, of loci where we detected at least one significant gene in, in cis. And I think that this is an, this approach and other similar approaches are very, very fruitful and then provide very nice um, 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 data that is, that is very rich and seems to be very informative uh, of what is going on in these loci. However, to be able to really apply these, these approaches with success in a way that is actually informative, uh, particularly for Chiwas, there are still many outstanding questions that we, that we should tackle as a, as a field.
So one of the interesting things that we sort of a little bit was over in the in the paper is that there is this the, the low side that or the effects that we detect with with our Stingsy CRISPR approach does have an overlap with these. EQTLs, but the overlap is relatively modest. And we're currently digging into kind of why that it is, why, why that is the case, and in what kind of effects are best captured by, let's say, EQTLs versus CRISPR. We see some signs that some of the, the lack of overlap is due to um, cell context uh, specificity. And that is, of course, a little bit of um, a bigger question for the CRISPR tools that can be often applied at scale in, in a rel relatively limited set of cell types that we can actually grow in vitro. Then there's also the question of um, what, is the, what is the best combination of um, enhancer silencing and other more crude uh, genome function perturbations versus actual nucleotide uh, level um, editing that often have very subtle effect sizes that are difficult to do at, at scale. So there is there is many questions to, to um, um, answer there, but but also a lot of lot of excitement and I believe a lot of potential for discovery. And indeed, when we think about this sort of natural versus engineered variation, two complementary approaches to go after um, functional effects of genetic variants, they have both uh, many benefits and several caveats that are interestingly quite orthogonal. And I think that uh, sort of thinking about how to use these, these tools jointly may be a way to sort of cancel out some of the caveats and then be able to distill to the shared biology in the best possible way. And when it comes to the cis regulatory effects, some of the lessons learned just to highlight, I do think that we need a diverse toolkit um, and a user manual for that toolkit to know what, what, which tools give which types of insights and are best suited for the particular question that you have. Um, and while there is a, a lot of experimental and computational work to do, we're not done with the CIS regulatory challenge at all. I think that we have a relatively good understanding of what are the right questions to ask and what are some of the approaches and methods how we can actually answer those questions. And I think overall the challenge re seems relatively tractable. And I think the bigger challenge actually lies in kind of um, in the question of then what? So uh, even with the current approaches and the work that has been done thus far, we likely know the causal genes for like some thousands of GWAS loci. But for many of these, these loci for these genes, we have actually, actually no idea what they do or very little idea. And this kind of comes down to the sort of valley of death that I pinpointed below, where we have relatively limited insights on, on what do genes and variants do at the level of cells and at the level of uh, tissues. And again, here we can think of, about this uh, in terms of the sort of fundamental approaches that can be used and that people have used to try to address this question. We can use different association approaches to molecular phenotypes in the sort of trans EQTL type of setting that has proven to be quite challenging, but, but potentially still fruitful, especially with single cell, uh, very large single cell data. One can also associate genetic variation to in vitro cellular phenotypes from large numbers of human donors, either individually or in cell villages. And one can use uh, sort of cellular phenotypes that are inferred from molecular data, such as pathway activity or transcription factor activity and, and such um, uh, phenotypes. And then, of course, there's perturbation approaches, CRISPR screens, working model organisms, etc. And there are many, many open questions here regarding the best approaches and basic biology. And one of the basic biological questions that, that I've been thinking about quite a bit is to which extent do we need to characterize variant function versus gene function? And actually, I think that there is a way to kind of think about how do we sort of <laughs> put these two things together and how does variant function relate to gene function? And so when we think about how do we do this work? So, so we've identified some variants that associate to diseases or other sort of higher level traits. And then we've identified how those variants affect um, the target gene in, in cis. And then, so what mediates that, that the, the relationship of, of, of those effects in cis to the downstream effects in trans should um, in most cases be some sort of a function between functional gene dosage and the downstream function of the, of the gene. And in this way, the sort of gene dosage can act as a kind of point of convergence of cis regulatory effects and, and then um, further to downstream uh, function. 
And my lab has been kind of like um, trying to bark at this tree for 10 years now. It's tough. Um, um, more recently, for the past couple of years, we've been, we've been um, uh, using CRISPR tools to gradually modulate gene expression up and down and linking that to cellular phenotypes. That will be a story for, for another day. I'll also mention that, of course, this, these relationships are multidimensional and context dependent. Uh, but I think that there is interesting things to, to kind of discover here. And the, and the sort of like rationale for, for thinking about gene dosage as this kind of like a joint uh, framework is, is not just sort of like my, my invention, uh, but it's actually supported by what we know about genetic architecture, where rare Mendelian disease and other types of rare diseases are, are quite strongly often dominated by coding loss of function variants that lead to loss of functional gene dosage, and then common complex disease, of course, being driven by regulatory variation. And we know that there is, there is very strong overlap between the two, even at the level of individual genes. And that may suggest that in, indeed gene dosage can, can function as this kind of like a joint framework to bring these things uh, together under the same biological rationale. And this can have applications from precision medicine to drug development and also to basic molecular biology. Much of what we know about gene function these days is based on very drastic gene knockouts and whether that is, is actually sort of uh, interpretable in terms of the much more subtle perturbations that we see in nature is, I think, an interesting question to address. And this is my last slide. So, um, so if we think about, so if indeed gene dosage ends up being this kind of like a point of convergence for cis regulatory effects, and then kind of like how these, this cis regulation and different variants there uh, translate into gene function and, and forward. Um, are there then analogous points of convergence at the level of, for example, cellular programs as, a, as an outcome of perturbation of multiple different genes and then tissue phenotypes as an outcome of perturbations of different cellular programs across multiple different cell types, and then uh, disease as a, as a, as a real result of more, more system level uh, perturbation? And I think there is a tremendous amount of work to be done to just kind of like map those components. What are these, these uh, different, different things that might be somehow uh, impacting uh, higher level uh, functional layers? And also a lot of work to be done in, in, in thinking about the architecture of, of these uh, in terms of nonlinearities, interactions. Do these convergence points even exist? And while some of these specifics are likely to be um, um, really specific to, to, to the systems or, or diseases um, that you're focused on, I would hope that there are some architecture and approaches that actually generalize and help us to kind of uh, address this, this, this question more broadly. And there is really a lot of work to do here. And I think that to be successful in this, us as geneticists really need to join forces with, with people in molecular systems biology and other similar fields that are approaching this question from a, from a slightly different uh, angle. I'll stop there and thanks, thanks for listening. I can't hear anyone in the room. Okay. Uh, Tuli, now I can thank you with the microphone on. Um, uh, so we have a few minutes for questions. Uh, and I do have mine, but first let me see if there are questions in the audience. Yes, please. Just to follow up on Uh, Shamil, I'm going to need you to repeat the question. I can't re we can't really hear the microphones there. There is the microphone. Uh, sorry, Michel Georges. Uh, and it's to follow up on the Jonathan's and Mustafa Harvey paper on the sort of the mismatch between the EQTL and the, the disease loci, just sort of to make to sort of discuss together and make sure I understand. Do you envisage that as being the fact that what we have missed so far is due to genes? for which at the present time, no EQTL at all have been detected. You know, maybe because their expression level is very low or they don't like, or they, they sort of resist perturbation in most cell types, or can it be specific effects affecting genes that are in addition to that, subject to EQTL that have been detected already? 
Yeah, so so the way I think about it is that, I mean, we do have quite comprehensive EQTL catalogs, but it's just that those EQTLs are, they, they very easily pick the sort of um, very strong, often promoter-driven driven effects that are sort of like the, the, the lowest hanging fruit in terms of the full spectrum of all regulatory variants that the gene may carry. And those variants easily then sort of mask other independent regulatory loci that may exist further away, for example, in, in enhancers. And then also that the power of many EQTL studies is not really sufficient to discover all of these effects. And then especially if they're highly context specific, et cetera, it's, it's even trickier. So basically that the study design of EQTL studies is, is not, are very well suited to find those GWAS relevant um, um, effects. Uh, so, okay. Julie, at this point, I'll use my power as, as session chair and follow up with the question. So, and, and uh, I think you know what I'm going to ask, right? So, because a lot of people, like there are multiple papers, including uh, Hakimanish Mustafa's paper, and people think that, oh, this is a power issue. And uh, to me, the major question is not where are all these remaining QTLs. The major issue is that we do have large effect QTLs well power to find them at relevant genes. We know the gene is involved. We know change in the amount of message causes the phenotype. These do not, they are mostly in promoters. These do not change any phenotypic change, in any phenotypic effect, right? So we call them red herring QTLs. This is not commonly in my life, call them red herring QTLs. So why do this exist, right? We can, we can find, we can increase power, we can find more QTLs, but if most of those are red herring, where they come from, why do they exist, how we get rid of them? Yeah, no, good question. I mean, I, do not I, don't, really have, I, I, don't, I don't really have good data to support so this, but, but I think that, I mean, it must come down to basically sort of um, a cell type specificity of downstream gene function. That even when you have a disease relevant gene, you perturb that in a, in a different context and it doesn't actually have a phenotypic effect. And we have actually seen this in, for example, in there is, uh, is it PAX8 or some terrible Mendelian uh, disease gene that just causes like a horrible, horrible phenotype. And I think it was um, sort of like a liver liver specific, like a liver disease that, that this gene was, was driving. And then when we look at, at GTX EQTL data, we see that, oh, there's this ginormously big EQTL in affecting this gene, just like a huge effect size. And we're like, these EQTL should not exist. And actually then when we looked across um, the different tissues, it did not exist. It was not active in liver because in liver, you cannot perturb that gene without getting uh, very, very bad consequences. In other tissues, you could. So probably this, this EQTL variant was sitting in some context specific enhancer that, that just didn't affect uh, the relevant tissue where this gene had a functional role and that's what, it, what allowed it to exist. Okay, context is the answer. So Magnus, the, the, the last question here, please. Yeah, so isn't the, the uh... Okay, Magnus Norberg. Um, so, isn't the simplest explanation to the question you asked, Shamil, that they're just neutral, right? That we see them as EQCR precisely because they don't matter. And when we have done this in, in Arabidopsis, it's clear that the EQCL are heavily biased towards things that are peripheral in all kinds of interaction networks, protein-protein interaction, regulatory networks, and so on. They're not conserved between species. You know, everything fits that it's just it's just noise, right? That's where you see them. Well, I go, I go to liver. I, I look at LDL receptor. There is a massive QTL in liver for LDL receptor. I know there is a non-coding GWAS hit in LDL receptor. This QTL does nothing to cholesterol level. Yeah. That's, that's my observation. I'm absolutely puzzled. I think I'm with Dooley that there is a supplement context. I believe it's probably supplement than, than a tissue type. And I'm very interested in talking to uh, Michelle George and you about what happens in other organisms because I don't know if it's a human specific story or not. Um, uh, Tuli, I'm sorry, I, I, we, we have to move on. Uh, and it's, it's uh, my great pleasure to introduce uh, NASA Synod Armstrong. Uh, they hail from Fred, uh, Fred Hutch Institute in Seattle, uh, and uh, this will continue our discussion of context, I guess, and, and effects. <laughs>
All right. Hello, everybody. Thanks so much for being here. And thank you for inviting me. This is my first time at the NIH, so I'm very excited. Um, I'm going to be talking today about connecting environmental exposures to molecular traits using genetics. Um, and uh, there we go. OK, um, I'm going to give an example today about cancer. Uh, and this is a particularly uh, uterine uh, or endometrial cancer. Um, and I think cancer is an example of a complex trait that we consider a lot. Uh, and specifically, we expect there to be some contribution of genetic variants to these traits, uh, in this case, germline genetic variants. Uh, and uh, in addition to that, also environmental exposures. When we think about the ways in which genetics and environment might be complementary to one another, they might interact with one another, there's a lot of different relationships that we could expect. Um, and I think really the question that I'm excited about that many of you are excited about is trying to understand better the ways in which both genetic and environmental risk is conferred. So what is it about genetic and environmental factors that results in, uh, in disease burden? Uh, so if we think about this in the context of cancer and look historically, there are a lot of exposures that people discovered which were resulting in associations with cancer. And over the course of the last hundred years, we've identified a number of molecular biomarkers that contribute to those. So when I'm thinking about biomarkers in this context, they have many different structures, but things that, uh, that have an effect from the environment, which then results in increased burden or decreased burden uh, of disease. So examples of these include things like blood pressure, where blood pressure has a very small but, but potentially significant association with uterine cancer. Uh, and we can understand this in the context of disease liability, where there's some threshold. And above that threshold, people are considered to have their disease. And so as a result of that, we can look at individuals based on this blood pressure risk and understand the ways in which that might be associated with other traits uh, or environmental exposures or genetics. Uh, and so in this case, we can understand genetics by looking at genetic variants, uh, developing something like a polygenic risk score for blood pressure or, or looking at Mendelian randomization uh, and understand better the ways in which individual genetic variants contribute to blood pressure and then further uh, to cancer. And of course, this is true with many different biomarkers, right? We don't understand this in the context just of blood pressure, but there's others as well, including things like progesterone and inflammation, which contribute to differential risk of, of this disease and many other diseases. And I think this model is great. It helps us understand ways in which genetic variation, environmental variation, and to interact through these intermediate phenotypes that help us give a, hopefully give us a better understanding of the mechanism underlying the disease. Uh, but I think it's also somewhat limited in some ways. Uh, and I'm going to give you an example of the ways in which this model might be limited uh, through a very particular type of exposure. In this context, this environment that I'm looking at is a pathogen, uh, Lyme disease, and the ways in which Lyme disease might contribute to risk uh, indirectly and directly uh, to, uh, in the context of this disease. So Lyme disease is caused by ticks carrying this bacteria, Borrelia burgdorferi. Uh, and, that, and Lyme disease is something that's very common, uh, and uh, in particular, it's rising in frequency. So if we look at, this is a map from the USDA of, in 1996, where cases of Lyme disease were reported uh, in the Northeastern United States. And compared to that to 2018, we see a much larger range and also many more individuals being affected. This is a trend that's been continuing as a result of a variety of different things I'm happy to talk about uh, in questions. But this increase in risk uh, for Lyme disease is driven by differences in exposure to ticks potentially. Uh, and we want to understand better whether or not we could use genetics and other tools to look at the mechanism underlying the development of Lyme disease and use that for developing interventions to help prevent the disease. So is there some sort of genetic predisposition to Lyme disease that we can consider? So Hannah Olila and Satu Strauss uh, have uh, ran a genome-wide association study and discovered in a strong association on chromosome 11 uh, with Lyme disease. So individuals who had Lyme disease had a much higher uh, burden of, of variant in this particular gene, SCGB1D2. And this is a weird example because it's actually a common trait, uh, or sorry, a common variant uh, in SCGB1D2 that is a coding variant. And this coding variant affects the structure of the protein uh, by changing the alpha helix. Uh, and so as a result of that, that, that helps with the, the confirmation of this like small uh, secreted protein. Uh, and by, as a result of that, the individuals have higher rates of Lyme disease. Um, this is really interesting because we actually don't really know what secretoglobins do. The entire family, there's 11 of them in humans, and it's kind of very poorly understood what their mechanism is or how they act or what their purpose is. All we know is that they're secreted. Some of them bind to some hormones or maybe also to PCBs, polychlorinated biphenyls. And there's like kind of not really good understanding of what's going on. Uh, but we found this association with Lyme disease. 
So what we can do is we can take this protein and actually see whether or not it has an effect on uh, Borrelia burgdorferi itself. That's exactly what we did. We can start by looking at what mechanism we might care about there. And uh, SCGB1D2 itself, when we look in GTEx, is very highly expressed in the skin, which suggests that maybe it's acting directly uh, through the, the exposure to Lyme disease. Um, and we can actually see this not just in skin, but specifically in single cell RNA-seq data set that was published recently, which shows that SCGB1D2 is actually a marker gene of sweat gland cells, both the clear cells and the dark cells. And so as a result of that, we kind of thought that maybe it'd be acting as like a bacterial defense barrier for the skin, uh, but we didn't really know exactly, and we wanted to try that out. Uh, and so we collaborated with, uh, with a number of individuals here in, in Mickey Tal's lab, uh, Paige, Sarah, and Grace, who helped run these experiments where we looked at Borrelia burgdorferi growth in vitro. So we can take a control sample here, which is just growing Borrelia in the normal conditions. It's this anaerobic condition of the very specific media, but we look at the expression of, of GFP over time and we can see that it grows pretty nicely. If you give Borrelia an exposure of the wild type SCGB1D2 variant, it actually grows substantially slower and almost gets completely wiped out in the first day of, of this experiment. Uh, and then in addition to that, if we compare that to the variant version of this that's present uh, as a GWAS association, then there's definitely a little bit of a growth loss, but it, it actually grows pretty well in the presence of this, uh, this modified SCGB1D2. And so individuals with that allele likely can't clear at Borrelia as quickly, and we think that probably reduces the efficacy of the immune response or takes longer to have an immune response. And as a result of that, these individuals are more likely to be affected by the disease and have a more severe disease. So we thought this was really cool because basically what we're doing is we're taking this gene environment association in humans and we're actually making it more about a gene environment association in Borrelia, right? Borrelia, from the perspective of them, they're like living fine and then all of a sudden they get exposed to this weird human protein and they are not able to survive anymore. So the complex interaction between these host pathogen systems allows us to discover ways in which the environment and exposure for different organisms is relevant in different ways. Um, I think this is super cool. Uh, and one thing that we want to do is try to understand better why or how this might be going on. So if we go back to the, uh, the measurement before and look at the expression data, we want to understand the, the ways in which SCGB1 to 2 might be acting in other tissues, because we know that chronic Lyme disease is infecting multiple tissues and there may be something going on with that. Um, and we also had uh, been talking to uh, community members who've been affected by Lyme disease. And there was a large burden of individuals who've, who've had high rates of miscarriage and many other uh, diseases of the female reproductive tract. And we noticed that in addition to being highly expressed in skin, SCGB1E2 is also very highly expressed in the uterus and cervix. And one, uh, we thought this might be related in mechanism because if you look at the human protein atlas uh, for expression of SCGB1E2 in the uterus, we actually see that it's primarily expressed in the glandular cells, which are secretory within that organ as well. And so that supports the idea that maybe scgb one e 2 the secreted protein, is acting in similar ways between the tissues, and providing some sort of protection uh, against Borrelia and potentially other uh, spirochete bacteria or other bacteria. So what do we do with that? Well, is this potentially related to other diseases? And, and Paige actually started looking at this more and found that if we look at the map geospatially across the United States of where Lyme disease cases are occurring, and the map geospatially across the United States in the same time period of where uterine cancer cases are occurring, they're like weirdly overlapping with one another in a way that we definitely did not expect. And of course, this is kind of like, you know, hand wavy and like not being super secure about all of these findings. If we run this as like, as like a, you know, covariate adjusted model with, uh, across the different counties within the US, we actually see a, a significant association. But all of that is done on like, we don't really know exactly what's going on level. Let's, let's look at this within individuals. So we turned to the All of Us Consortium uh, and mm -hmm. together with Monika Perez, uh, a student of mine at UW, uh, we started looking at the odds ratio of individual um, associations between people who had been exposed to or reported Lyme disease in their electronic medical record or survey data and whether or not they had then also reported endometrial cancer. So we see a not significant association with endometrial cancer in the surveys. Uh, but there is an association with a number of other uh, outcomes associated with the female reproductive tract, including uterine fibroids, and then PCOS and endometriosis. And these are like pretty large effects, like we're talking about 1.5 fold or something like that. 
And when we turn to EHR, we see an even stronger association, almost two to threefold is stronger uh, and higher rates of menorrhagia, miscarriage, uterine fibroids within EHR, and then a slightly stronger association with endometrial cancer. We're trying to see whether or not this holds up and we're actually expanding this analysis now. We just got uh, like a collaboration going with this Truveta program, which has electronic healthcare data from 90 million Americans. And so we're gonna be starting to look at this on a much larger scale as well to see if we can have uh, even more associations. But at this point, I think we have pretty good evidence that even if there's not necessarily a strong association with uterine cancer, there's a lot of other tra traits of the femoral tract that are associated with, uh, with Lyme disease uh, as an outcome. Now that's really cool, but we also don't really know what's going on, even if we have this association, right? So what do we do to understand that better? Well, we can look at other data sets. So for instance, in TCGA, we see that individuals who have high SCGB1D2 versus low SCGB1D2, the individuals with high SCGB1D2 expression have much higher survivor rates. Uh, these, the the p-value here is, is 0.01, something like that, but the individuals are surviving for much longer. And then we can consider this in the context of endometrial adenocarcinoma and observe again that SCGB1D2 is primarily expressed in these glandular cells. So it's acting through some secretory mechanism and potentially protects against cancer or, or other traits of, of the endometrium. Okay, that tells us a little bit about what's going on, but we want to look more at mechanism. And I think understanding better what's happening in tissues is super important. And that's easier to do in the context of individual experiments and model organisms. So again, we worked with Mickey's lab on this. Uh, and where Paige infected uh, black sex mice who are thought to be not very responsive to, uh, to Lyme disease. Uh, they don't have very many symptoms. And mice are also really interesting because they actually don't have SCGB1D2 at all. There's no homolog. So they're a pretty good model system for testing this. So compared to uninfected mice, which have this nice endometrial structure, they have a very like kind of standard uh, uterine morphology. The infected black sex mice have this extreme cyst phenotype where there's a large number of cysts throughout the uterus. There's a lot of like gross morphological changes. And it seems like there's a huge amount of inflammation going on within the uterus. And we also found that the Borrelia itself is present within, uh, within the endometrium. So what we're doing now is following this up in human experiments. We're trying to see whether or not we can observe that. But overall, I think this supports the idea that Borrelia might be acting uh, directly on the uterus, and that could have an effect from an environmental side uh, from the human perspective. So effectively, what we did is we take this model that we already had of genetic variants and environment contributing to biomarkers, which then results in cancer risk, and then breaking that model slightly, where instead of just having genotype and environment separate from one another, we can actually have genetic variants like scgb one 2 that affect the environment that cells are exposed to. And that environmental difference, in this case, change in rate of Lyme disease, is actually going to contribute to differences in the biomarkers of endometrial cancer and result in differential health outcomes. So overall, what this tells us is that Lyme disease risk is modulated by these alleles of scgb one d 2 And it's a weird example of a coding variant that's had high frequency, but it supports the same model that we've been talking about throughout the rest of these talks. And I'm sure everyone else will discuss later today and tomorrow. Um, we also learned that, and that Lyme disease increases the rate of uterine cancer and endometrial cancer. And finally, we also learned that genetic variants can confer these differences in environment. So by understanding genetic invariance in the context of environment and environment in the context of genetic variance, we can learn much more about what's happening and the structure of these traits and hopefully better understand the ways in which these different mechanisms vary in different contexts. With that, I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you. Well, thank you very much now. So this is amazing. This, this both brings context to the floor and uh, highlights complexity. So uh, Aravinda has the first question. Oh, okay, go ahead. Um, Aravinda Chakravarti from NYU. I mean, that's a really a cool, cool example. And it, 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 uh, so this is an ignorant question, not knowing all the details about um, the bug. So do you know it's really the, the bug that travels to other sites or is it some secreted protein? Because your mouse experiments, you know, you just use the bug itself, it may be or something else. Because if that's the case, there may be other sites you could find just simply from, it could be, you know, SCGB1, 
Yeah, that's a great question. I mean, Lyme disease, particularly chronic Lyme disease, is extremely multifactorial and, and includes many different symptoms and many different organ systems. And so I think it's likely that some of those are driven by different sorts of effects. But in the mouse model, we can actually see that there is direct infection. We have a we have a both a luminescent and a fluorescent Borrelia bacteria, and both of those are active and present in the uterus, which suggests that at least in the context of the uterus, uh, it's uh, it's pretty relevant. Um, so in 1996, somebody previously reported this, and it's just been kind of ignored for 30 years, uh, which you know might tell you something. But um, at the same time, there's been a lot of evidence that the um, Borrelia infects the bladder, and so there's probably potentially some crosstalk as a result of that. Okay, so uh, before the next question, what wasn't clear here: the 53 prointerleukin variant is it a GWAS hit for for the cancer uh, GWAS, or it's not? Uh, it's a subthreshold association for uterine polyps. It's not uh, high frequency. And the problem is that Lyme disease is not super common. So it's like you're capturing probably no more than one to two. And the estimate I got from the county level data is about one to two percent of uterine cancer cases might be driven by Lyme disease. But of course, finding cases of uterine cancer from areas with high rates of Lyme disease is something in future, future studies. So if anybody happens to have large numbers of genotyped individuals from areas with high Lyme disease, very interested in talking more. Okay, Magnus Norberg, then Zander. Uh, Magnus Norberg. Um, okay, so what do we know about the biology of Borrelia? I mean, uh, is the genetic variation what's the main host? Have you sequenced Borrelia from lizards, mice, deer, and where do they affect the whole thing? Yeah, totally. So, uh, I mean, yeah, so mice and uh, so deer are, are thought to often not be super affected by. By Borrelia, um, the the I think the mouse and and deer kind of like model and, and kind of like tick biology. There's like a whole ecosystem going on there. Uh, one thing that we've been talking about collaborating with is trying to do more like population level uh, survey of this mm -hmm. on something like Martha's Vineyard, where around 40% of all ticks have Borrelia. We can start comparing the population genetics and the the kind of like natural history of the Borrelia, the ticks, the mice, the deer, right. potentially like human exposures. And so as a result of that, we'll be able to get a better sense of the ways in which those are related to one another. But right now that's not done at a huge scale. So, um, there's like a, there's a few projects that are trying to, to scale that up right now. And of course that's like a growing area of concern as Lyme right. disease becomes more prevalent. And you're sequencing the Borrelia as well, right? To yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So there's like kind of this citizen science approach right now where people who have ticks can send them in for sequencing and then test that, and then we can sequence the Borrelia. And so I think scaling up that sort of thing and involving more of the community in this sort of project would be really helpful because we want to capture a large geographic range of large rural areas, and it's just really hard to do that at scale. Uh, Zander? We have a question from Neil Rich online. Um, in your epi studies, can you include antibiotic treatment effects? Ah, so yeah, so this is just looking at an association of Lyme disease versus not. Uh, so those individuals who have been diagnosed with Lyme disease frequently are given doxycycline tra treatment. So this isn't necessarily looking at chronic Lyme disease uh, cases. The chronic Lyme disease, there's like kind of the um, post-treatment Lyme disease syndrome, PTLDS, which is like if you've been received doxycycline. And then there's also a lot of individuals who just don't ever receive doxycycline because they don't know they have Lyme disease. So at this point, those two aren't separated, but that's certainly an active area of research in the lab and would love to talk more about that. Well, thank you very much, Nasa. Uh, thank you. It is now my pleasure to invite Francesca Luca from Wayne State University. Uh, and this is the last talk of the session. So I think we'll learn more about the same uh, set of questions and we'll transition to a discussion. All right. Um, good morning, everybody. Uh, it is really an honor to um, be here today and contribute to this um, exciting conversation. Um, and so, as uh, we just heard, um, we've been we started talking about context, um, you know, early this morning, and. Uh, um, <clears throat> um, it doesn't progress the slides. Let's see if we can do it from here. All right, it's it's fine. Yeah, it's fine. Um, all right. So um, 
So this is a brief outline of what I uh, want to share with you today. So um, start with defining context, which may seem obvious, but hopefully it's not. Um, and then go over how we go about analyzing genetic effects of molecular function across context, how we translate uh, this finding in function from molecular to organismal level, and uh, you know some conclusion and perspective. Um, and so. Um, what I wanted to uh, start with is uh, this idea that to predict phenotypes and genotypes, we cannot ignore environmental and non-genetic effects. And it's my opinion that this has become already obvious from the conversation we have uh, started having this morning, uh, but it's also based on a significant body of literature from um, you know, several groups that are present here uh, and also what we have done. Um, all right, so how do we define context? So if we think about the organism, the first thing that come to mind our chemical exposures, our pathogens, diet, um, psychosocial factors, um, age, development, sex. But now as we go uh, down into um, the biological cascade, and so we look at organ, tissue, cell, and even subcellular level, um, in addition to this organismal level context, we need to consider other contexts. And Tuli was mentioning, for example, uh, cell type and tissue type. So I like to think about it you know, as kind of a broader definition of context that also includes uh, like the metabolic state of the cells, differentiation state, and at the subcellular level, things like the intracellular environment, the epigenetic landscape. And so then uh, when we think about a context, so for example, uh, exposure to stress, which might come from neighborhood violence or low socioeconomic status, which is something we're studying in our group. Um, this is perceived at the organismal level, but then when we go at an um, organ or cell or subcellular level, um, there's additional context we need to uh, keep in mind, uh, and that exposure is actually combined with um, what is the, um, the, the uh, endogenous context. And so um, kind of the, the point I'm trying to make here is that the response of the organism reflects both exogenous as well as endogenous context. Um, and that this endogenous context, uh, we can capture them with molecular studies. But there's also another point I'd like to make is that this endogenous context uh, can also reflect past exposures. So while the organism is exposed in this moment or has been chronically exposed, when we look at kind of a suborganismal level, we can actually also capture these past exposures. So how do we go about studying these genetic effects then on molecular function across context? Um, so some of, this is sort of going deeper into some of the things that uh, the Thule was introducing earlier. So I'm using this terminology here of in vivo, ex vivo, and in vitro. And I know, uh, you know some of you may be familiar with this uh, concept kind of in different context is a not intended pun, uh, but uh, I wanna kind of bring everybody on the same page of what I mean here. So uh, when I'm talking about in vivo exposure, so in all cases, we have a cohort that we're interested in. Um, and so we have genotype information from this cohort, but now with an in vivo setting or study design, um, we are, are actually able to measure the organismal level exposure. And then we isolate organ or tissues or primary cells and we measure uh, endogenous phenotypes or intermediate phenotypes at that, at that point. We then ex vivo study design, uh, we isolate uh, the cells and then we actually uh, perturb the context or, or modify the context in the lab. And then finally, in vitro studies, uh, which I'm defining here as in vitro studies, are studies where um, you know, we are using immortalized cell lines or iPSC derived cell lines uh, we then uh, exposure that happens in the lab. And so there's advantage and disadvantages to each of these approach. So with, with, the, with an in vivo approach, uh, we certainly can measure complex context. Uh, we are preserving what I'm calling here the epigenetic landscape. And what I mean here is, you know, whatever modification that um, are due to the environment or to the context and remain in the tissue or in the cell, in the biological sample that we're analyzing. We can preserve the tissue architecture with uh, spatial uh, transcriptome in spatial genomic approach, we can then study that. The disadvantage is that uh, we can only uh, study um, these, these samples um, if they are in accessible tissues, such as blood, for example, or um, post-mortem. 
And so here are some examples of um, how we're using this approach in my lab. We've been working with a cohort of over 250 children with asthma in Detroit, and we are measuring, in addition to um, you know, collecting their genotype data, we are collecting a wide range of psychosocial, developmental, and immunological data, as well as clinical data. Um, we look at blood, and then we are looking for this gene-environment interaction, uh, which um, I'm when I talk about gene environment interaction, I'm essentially talking about genetic effects that change uh, in different contexts or are different in different contexts. So here's an example of some of the results that um, we've been able to uh, collect and how they can impact our understanding of uh, complex trait variation. So uh, this gene, GAS8, is a gene that we know from other studies that um, low expression of this gene is associated with an increased risk of asthma. The pointer is not working. Um, so um, what we also find in our data is that the allele at the SNP, uh, which is an interaction in QTL, increases the expression of, its, of these genes, but only in individuals that have perceived high socioeconomic status. So there's this combined effect of um, the social environment as well as genetic, uh, genetic risk. So with ex vivo approaches, the advantages is that um, we can um, expose the cells to a specific context in the lab so we can uh, better study the cellular context, uh, but also that they can be used um, to perform experimental validation of these uh, context-specific effects that we might have been able um, to detect with in vivo studies. Now, the limitations are that, um, again, we, we can only work with accessible tissues and that you know, with, there's limited ability to uh, focus on the tissue architecture. Um, you know, there's a little bit we can do with organ system, but, but not as much as, um, you know, when, when we actually have access to all organs and tissues. And so this is an example of a, um, a setting where this approach uh, may work well. So we're interested, for example, in studying the effect of uh, plastic components on cardiovascular disease. Um, and so um, it would be really hard to perform this type of study in vitro because we would need both the exposure uh, as well as the relevant uh, cell type or tissue type. So here we're working with endothelial cells and we have a, a, a biobank of endothelial cells. These are primary cells and we can expose them in the lab to plastic components. And so that then allows us to uh, look at the uh, molecular function of genetic variants and how they interact with this exposure, both at the chromatin accessibility and the gene expression level and connected it to uh, complex trait variation. And another uh, example is uh, using a single cell genomic approaches. And this is in, um, again, in the um, uh, asthmatic children cohort we're working with. So using uh, single cell genomic approaches, what we've been doing is being able to look at um, uh, PBMC's response to uh, immunomodulation uh, in the context of prior exposure to psychosocial environments, uh, as well as uh, genetic background. and so. You know, important, important key points here are that, uh, you know, we are preserving when we treat PBMCs, we are preserving the cell-cell microenvironment. Um, and the other, the other advantage of using these technologies is that we can look beyond like the mean gene expression molecular phenotype and we can look at genetic and environmental effects or context effect on the variability of the gene expression phenotype. And so finally, um, you know, with in vitro approaches, I think it's quite obvious that you know we're losing that ability of uh, having a memory of past exposure. But what we're gaining is that we can virtually study any cell type, and that's because we can um, differentiate them in vitro to a variety of different cell type. And again, we have limited tissue architecture that we can study. However, um, you know one advantage is that now we can at the same time study um, context-specific effect of genetic variants from different cell type. Um, from the same individual. And this is a study where uh, we have exposed the um, uh, LCLs, B cell, um, immortalized B cells, um, induced pluripotent stem cells, and cardiomyocytes derived from iPSCs to 28 different treatments. Um, and so uh, what we've found is that if we consider multiple cellular contexts, we can actually identify these complex uh, G by E effects. And so, um, again, I'm sorry the pointer doesn't work, but um, you can see that we can identify the QQ plot shows a different type of G by E that we can identify. So we can identify cell type 
by genotype effect, we can identify treatment by genotype effect, but we can also identify cell type by treatment by genotype effect. So this is an example of, you know, even with an in vitro treatment, there's complexity that can be analyzed um, at the cellular level. And the other major point of, uh, of this work that we've done uh, that I'd like to make here is that we find that genes with gene environment interaction are less likely that we find in our study are less likely to be found in GTEx or as well as in prior studies of gene regulation where the environmental context is not measured or you know not not considered so it's ignored and so that points to the discussion we we're having before you know um following Tully's talk that it's not just a matter of you know and it's not just a matter of having the same genes or being able to find um, EQTLs or non-coding regulatory variants for genes for which we don't know them but really finding effects that um, are context specific and so uh, briefly, how do we think about translating genetics to function then? Um, so I wanted to show with you two types of approaches that we're taking. Uh, one is partitioning heritability for complex traits using molecular G by E annotations. And so this is one of the first studies we've done in my group. We looked at 250 contexts, cellular contexts. So this is 50 treatments that we apply to five different cell types. Um, and what we found is that for certain traits, the G by E contribution to heritability is higher than the genetic contribution. So I, I think one important point to make here is that one, we can use a molecular G by E annotation to characterize uh, complex trait heritability. And second, that um, you know, we have to keep in mind that uh, the clinical phenotypes or the complex traits are complex, but the environment is complex as well. And so uh, depending on the specific environments that we're looking at and the specific trait we're looking at, we can find that sometimes the G effect is stronger and other times actually the G by E effect is stronger. The other approach is an approach where we can actually use, uh, uh, you know, all we've learned so far from GWAS and here specifically TWAS to then understand about this context specific effects. So, uh, you know, in TWAS, we're all familiar with uh, the approach. We are collecting genetic variation to complex trait to genetically predicted gene expression. So in other words, we are finding genes where variation in gene expression is associated with the trait. Well, one thing to keep in mind is that once we have these genes, the um, expression level of these genes also varies as a function of the context, so the environmental exposure, as well as gene environment interaction. So in other words, we can leverage what we learned from TWAS to understand what are the environmental and the G by E risk factors for complex traits. And so here's an example. Um, this is, again, work uh, we've done with our asthmatic children cohort. And, you know, we're focusing on health disparities in urban environments. We know that urban minorities are more likely to be exposed to psychosocial and physical stressors. And so what this uh, image here is showing on the left, there's a column that shows the psychosocial variables that we are considering. In the middle, there's a column that shows the genes and on the right, the complex traits. And you can see these, li these um, lines that connect the three columns. So the way to interpret this is that uh, the expression of these genes is associated with complex traits based on transcription wide association studies data. And these are asthma and other asthma related phenotypes we're looking at. And on the left, the connection between the psychosocial variable and the gene expression uh, is uh, sunny the winfer from G by EQTL mapping, but it could also be, uh, you know, in other set settings we use um, gene expression response. And so essentially we can draw this connection where once we've identified the genes and we know that the mechanism that connects the gene to the complex trait is variation in gene expression, we can actually now connect which environmental risk factors also contribute to that disease. And so in conclusion, um, hopefully I've convinced you today, uh, you know, kind of following up on what the other speaker has said, that um, genetic effects in human and molecular and complex phenotype vary across context. Um, I've also, um, you know, uh, tried to make the point that molecular studies allow us to dissect the mechanism underlying the organismal response, and also to consider cellular and subcellular context. And so kind of a broader implication of this, um, uh, you know, area of research is that if we think about it, even if genetic risk is not directly actionable, we can modify individual risk by reducing both environmental risk and also genetic risk through gene environment interactions. And so if we think about, you know, perspective where we are now, um, so I think we're in that little star there in the middle. Um, so there's like three major areas of work, you know, if we think also, like, if we go also beyond, you know, human genetics, right, there's three major um, areas of work that have 
a tiny little overlap. Uh, one is like the GWAS field, where we collect large cohort, we collect clinical data, we have the genotypes. Uh, there's the molecular QTL studies, where the sample size is generally smaller, we have the genotypes, we have the molecular phenotypes, and we have the biological samples. Sometimes we look at context, but you know, usually not in a very extensive way. And then there's what I call the exposome field, which, you know, um, think about exposome a little bit kind of broader than the usual definition. It's not just chemical exposure, but it's like the broader environment, right? And so uh, in that field, organismal phenotypes are collected, um, but many, many contexts are collected and nicely characterized. Um, and so what I, th what I think that we want to be is actually in this other um, figure where that star becomes much bigger because actually the overlap of these three fields becomes bigger so that we actually have at the same time genetic data, uh, phenotypic data, um, context and environmental data, as well as the ability to do molecular studies. And sorry, my very last and very important slide is that, so it takes a team uh, to, and you cannot read that, but uh, what it says is that it takes a team to actually uh, do this work. And so most importantly, it takes an interdisciplinary team. So, um, you know, that um, this work can be done really because I work with amazing colleagues, Roger Picareggi is one of them, and Sam Zilioli as well, Sam Zilioli is a psychologist. So uh, we actually do this interdisciplinary work that allows us to, you know, go beyond uh, uh, genetics and beyond uh, molecular mechanism and look at these complex environments. And thank you very much. So thank you very much, Francesca. So we have uh, time for a couple of questions. So Ravin the Chikravartis first. Thank you. Um, I'm fairly ignorant question that is, at least for genes now, we have a fairly good full catalog. So when you speak of context or environments, is there some, uh, I mean, what's the current thinking of how complete we might be in this, you know, because you're finding widespread interactions with almost most things you study. And I'm not saying it's not real, but how do we evaluate that? I think one way would be if you could study at least have an indication of how broad the environment is. So is, are there some ways to figure that part out? Thank you. Um, so I think it's, I think the question is actually two questions, right? One is um, how broad is the environment and which is the environment that matters if I understood um, you know, what, what you were asking. Um, and so how broad is, is the environment? Um, it is broad, it's very broad, right? And, um, and from a human genetics perspective, we are only kind of scratched the surface of analyzing um, you know, environmental effects on human phenotypes. But there's other fields that are, I think, more advanced uh, in, that, in that area. Um, which environment matters? Um, I think one way to think about it is that, you know, if you think about what the environment does to the human body and how we respond, um, uh, we, I cannot, you know, I cannot imagine that to every environmental stimulus corresponds a different molecular response, right? There's going to be some molecular responses that are shared. On the other hand, studies we've done, you know, we've done gene regulatory network studies, and we've seen that when you expose cells to a variety of different contexts, you don't always hit the same genes, okay? So there is there's environmental specificity or context specificity in the response, uh, but, but that doesn't mean that every single environment is gonna activate a different pathway. So does that make sense? So we need to look at diverse environments, but not, you know, potentially not to all of them. Now, what is the problem? That we don't know which environments are similar to each other until we actually study the response, right? So we need to be able to classify environment or group environments. And for some, we can use kind of biochemical data to do that, but for complex environment like psychosocial environments, right? We need to be able to know which ones um, activate or modify the same, um, you know, biological processes in the body to know then, okay, then maybe I don't need to look at all, at all of them, but I can look at these two or three. And I think collaborating with, you know, experts in kind of the environmental side of things, whether it's psychology, sociologists, 
or um, you know toxicologists is really going to help because they've been thinking about this from um, you know an environment and phenotype perspective and so you know we can contribute the molecular aspect to it but yeah it's it's I think it's a very important oh. question and strategically you know so I need to think about that maybe that should be the first step to do right deciding how many different environments do we need to characterize uh, 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 Francesco so I think this is very important this is all conceptual my understanding at least of the subtext of the question was that in genetics we have this is a number of variants there's a number of genes uh, there is a clear statistical process we have the finite catalog we have multiple test correction 510 minus 8 whatever fdr we know that we're dealing with a finite set of hypotheses like in agatha christie novel right so there is culprit among like this set of individuals in this castle and and there is a very clear statistical uh workaround for for this so I think what the what what Arvind's question implied is here you have an open field of possible hypotheses, and I think the question was more at least my my understanding of the question was that it it's not only about conceptual but partly about methodology. How do you address this statistically, being in this open field? Yeah, um, that's 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 a very good question. So um, so the way we've addressed it is you know the same way we address uh, multiple test correction for example in uh, um, you know in genomic in genomic data so we don't look at one environment at a time we usually look at a you know in the big studies we've done we had a variety of different environments and then you know at that point you apply multiple test correction the way you would apply it to like a variety of traits or a number of SNPs you're testing now you know because of the limited resources, right? And because of where the field is at at this point, was that an extensive um, survey of environments? No, it was not, you know, but it was a study on psychosocial factors. These are the psychosocial factors that make sense to study from a psychosocial point of view. Now, when I test their effect on human phenotypes or on, you know, gene expression, now I'm applying, you know, multiple test correction approach, for example. But, um, you know, it's, it's, it's a huge field if you think about it, right? So I think, you know, and I don't have necessarily an answer. So, but I, I think it's a very stimulated question and something we should be discussing. Thank you. I guess the last question, if there is any. Yes, just a second. Greg Gibson, thanks a lot, Francesca. It's beautiful. Um, I'm just wondering um, if you could give some thoughts on causality. Um, so you see G by E, and then you see interacting with the trait. When do we know that it's causing that response, and, it's re and alternatively, a response to the disease status itself? Yeah, that's a very, it's a very good question. So um, there's two answers that you know I like to give you, and you know, they're not necessarily the right answers, but, you know, kind of brainstorming on it. Uh, one is um, being able to actually perturb the environment with, and, you know, in the lab allows you at least to say, okay, I see that phenotype and it's necessary like an endophenotype, right? In vivo, now I'm actually perturbing the cells you know, say I see an endophenotype that's associated with a pathogen, I'm actually perturbing the cells with that pathogen and seeing the same effect. So I'm establishing causality, right? So that's one. Um, the other is, you know, when you go at the organismal level, and that's, you know, I think that's that's where things get a lot more complex. And, you know, I think the conversation is probably gone for a, for a long time. But, but that's, you know, that's a place where thinking about smart ways of how you establish causality is really important. You know, this, I think, specific study design like one study design that comes to mind that we've been discussing with my colleague is um you know thinking about something like COVID pandemic as a natural intervention so if you have samples before and after COVID, right you can now see you know and you consider COVID, you correct for all the immunological aspect of COVID, and you focus on the psychological aspect of COVID or the social aspect of COVID. can you actually see you know the changes that you would predict based on association studies that we've done in the past uh, thank you very much. So let's thank Francesco. Let's thank all the speakers of the session. And with great pleasure, I pass the baton to Barbara Stranger, who would lead the discussion. All right. Can we have all the panelists come up here, please? So um, I do have one announcement from the organizers. Lunch will now be at 1245. We have um, at least 
one speaker, I believe, who's going to be virtual. So I think we're just getting that set up. Okay. I can use this one. Um, all right, so um, in these previous talks today, um, this is kind of addressed to everybody here. Um, we heard a lot about trying to, okay, trying to connect um, trait, trait associated variation to function and identifying causal genes and pathways. And, um, and we heard that some of the challenges are perhaps related to context specificity of genetic effects. Um, and, and so I guess I would like to ask each of the panelists really what they see as the key questions we need to address in this area. Um, is, it, is it more environments? Is it a finer scale? We heard about different levels of organization here. Um, so, so I think just first, what are the scientific questions? And then maybe we can talk about how we best go about uh, answering those questions. Welcome, Brandon and Alkies. We can see you now. <laughs> yeah, so I don't I don't know if we're going in any order, but I'm sitting next to you. So I'm happy to start this off. Um, so I think that the is this part can you yes, that works. do you not hear me through this mic? Okay. So yeah, I think I can I can start a little bit by thinking about some of the key questions. I think that the presenters argued pretty clearly that um, context specificity, which includes cell type, environment, developmental trajectory, and things along those lines, are key to look for some of the genetic variation that may be trait associated that we don't currently see any mechanistic explanation for. Um, I think that studies beginning with some of the infection response, single cell, cell type specificity, et cetera, have demonstrated that we do indeed identify GWAS co-localizing variants that affect you know, very diverse contexts, diverse cell types, et cetera. And I think one of the big questions facing us is how do we actually begin to, to measure that and which environments, contexts, et cetera, do we actually test? So I think there are a few guiding principles, You know, some just coming from what do we know affects gene regulation? We know gene regulation changes dramatically during development and differentiation. We know gene expression and gene regulation you know, vary greatly during certain environmental responses. We can see this just in the small scale experiments on gene expression and both computational experimental studies have demonstrated that the um, sort of big contexts that modulate gene expression tend to correspond to the big contexts that modulate genetic effects on gene expression. So we can use that as a guiding principle on small scale studies to then decide where to, to look at large scale studies. We also can use what's available in terms of technology to guide this. So we know that now we have availability and better and better resolution of single cell techniques of, trans of spatial transcriptomics and others. So we have the opportunity to look at cell type and spatial data and interaction between cell types much more than we had previously. And I think, you know, I have many more comments, but maybe I'll let some of the other panelists jump in first. Maybe we just go down and order the table. Um, I mean, I, I agree with everything Alexa said. I mean, one thing that I, I kept thinking about this morning and, and trying to prepare for this was what Thule called these points of convergence and what Aravinda, I think, in a way called this counting of variants. How, how do cells count how many risk variants there are in a genome? In some sense, I think those are the same thing, right? So because it's there has to be some integration of you know dozens, hundreds of risk variants pulling at at, at processes, but then it's ultimately the processes that, that go ahead and, and do change cell biology and um, and cell function in, in ways that, that matter. So there has to be some sort of integration, um, you know, truly called it sort of the valley of death that maybe we don't know uh, enough about at this point. Um, so so I agree with that. And, and I think it's gonna be interesting to see how one can go um, about doing that. I guess one one open question in my mind is, can one, to what extent can one back out the cellular activities from molecular abundances? So if, if I told you the abundance of all the genes that make up the ubiquitin proteasome system in a cell, does that tell you how active that system is? Or is there other things you, you have to measure? Do you need actual reporters of 
um, of that system. And I mean, selfishly, I just said ubiquitin proteus system because we work on that quite a bit uh, in our yeast genetics uh, recently, and it turns out to be genetically quite complex. But but again, so the question is, you know, does one need dedicated activity reporters, or can one look at abundances and and you know figure out what the cell is up to? Uh, so we decided to go the order of the table. There are two copies of Brandon and Alkis. One is left on, of me on one screen. One is right of me on the other screen. So Brandon and Alkis, would you like to go with the screen which is left of me or right of me? All right, all right. I will ask Brandon to start us off. Great, thank you. Uh, really, really uh, tremendous uh, talks uh, to this panel really, raising all, all of the relevant issues I, I feel like in the field right now. What I'll briefly say is, um, as I think about this problem, I feel like we are, at, from what I learned from the talks, it seems like there's kind of two competing perspectives on how to kind of think about complex traits. And one of them kind of is kind of how we were all trained from the path dependence of kind of looking at predictive, right? trying to predict, you know, the phenotypes, these complex phenotypes from genotypes. And I think that's kind of how we've all been raised and how we continue to think about it and how we all work on it. But as I think about this last talk about uh, in particular, some of these vagaries of how G by E operates, I think we're, we might be running into a point where the science of the molecular underpinnings of the pathophysiology of a lot of these diseases is a much different science with much different answers that, and that are, you know, maybe not predictive at all, right, at the population scale. And so I, kind of what I'm dealing with from, these, from the talks this morning is, are we comfortable with a science where we're learning a lot about things kind of at the individual cellular level? You know, I study protein folding. But that set tells us nothing virtually about the way the disease is operating at the population scale, right? It's almost like a wave particle duality <laughs> type of split in the way we think about right, complex phenotypes of diseases. Are we comfortable with those two types of understandings being completely different with the hope that maybe eventually we'll kind of be able to walk them together? And so it's a little bit nihilistic, but it's also in some ways realistic based on what I've heard. That's all. All right. Well, um, I'll jump in with a few points. I agree with the statement that learning about molecular traits is not exactly the same thing as learning about disease. And we all want to learn about disease, of course. And uh, I mean, uh, this is something that, of course, Thule uh, really referred to as, as missing regulability, where um, you know we have methods that can tell us how much of uh, disease uh, heritability or SNP heritability is explained by uh, molecular trait QTL, and the answer right now is maybe only a fraction, and we could view the glass as half full and say, well, that's great that we're explaining a lot of disease heritability with that type of molecular data, or we could view the glass as half empty or more than half empty and say we're thirsty for explaining more of, of what's going on uh, in dis disease GWAS. And I also want to um, repeat the point that Julie made about dis distinction between you know, different types of functional data as we think about sort of getting more granular into cell types and cell states and cell context. We have what Thule called the ENCODE type of data where we have a, a very rich compendium of, of different types of functional data with very low sample size versus on the other hand, um, uh, molecular QTL data, where we're gonna need you know, 100 or, or maybe hundreds of samples to kind of gain QTL traction. And that's obviously gonna limit uh, you know, the, the kind of dimensionality of the types of data we can collect. So with, with those points in mind, I think you know, maybe stake out a few opinions about what the route forward might be. I think probably the, the one statement we can probably all agree on is that we collectively, the statistical genetics and functional genomics community, are definitely going to assay more fine-grained cell types and cell states and cell context. And in doing so, we're going to learn more about disease. And specifically, we're going to explain more disease SNP heritability. I don't know how much more, but definitely some more. We can probably agree on that. Um, I think that uh, maybe something we could do besides focusing on gene expression is we could look at other molecular traits, which have been maybe not as much well studied. Uh, you know, that might be a function of the technologies, but certainly, you know, chromatin uh, QTL 
uh, and there's other types of you know molecular traits. You know, the paper of Dong et al. 2022 Nature Genetics looked at enhancer uh, expression QTL. Uh, recent work uh, Who et al. 2023 Nature Genetics has looked at um, chromatin QT histone QTL in the GTEx samples at, at sort of ramping up to larger sample size. And then, of course, we have the trio of single cell EQTL papers uh, published in Nature and Science last year, which is sort of exciting to bring the, you know, bring, bring the single cell into the QTL world. Um, and so I think that, uh, you know, looking at QTL other than expression, other than bulk expression, but even other than single cell expression is, you know, potentially a rich route forward, both because, um, you know, other molecular traits may provide complementary information to expression, and also because, um, we know that other, like especially chromatin QTL, may be more cell type specific than expression uh, QTL. The, the Blueprint Consortium paper, going back to Ch Chad et al. 2016 uh, cell, has a nice figure illustrating that point. And then the other final point that I want to make is, is even though a ton of, you know, great statistical methods work has been done in this space dating back at least 13 years, uh, I think that when it comes to sort of small sample sizes, if we have if we have barely powered molecular QTL studies, I think there is more to do in the statistical method space to tie that to these disease GWAS as best as we can. Did I reach my end of the table? Yeah. Um, uh, so uh, I think when, when, when I think about what's being said here, right, uh, it's and I think about history of the field as we learned today, uh, it's the architecture of complex traits has been elusive, right? It's coding, then, oh, it's not coding, and then it's all bulk homeostatic expression. No, it's not. Uh, and uh, always our thinking goes where there's no data. And uh, now the slogan of today is context, uh, and I'm part of this. I also believe it's context. It must be. What, what else? And we're facing this infinite dimensional, infinite space of context suddenly. And we're thinking about collective data, including molecular traits, including, including environmental, including cell intrinsic and extrinsic. So the, 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 the problem with this um, is that uh, in all previous steps of this, there was an idea, this is our model. There was a simulation, there was understanding of statistical power and what data we're going to collect. So here at NHGRI, um, I'm thinking that is that is what's needed because you can collect in, in the infinite space of context, you can collect infinite amount of data and create a multitude of underpowered studies and learn nothing, right? So, so I think what we need, we need in addition to the idea that we're going to pursue context and the idea following what Francesca said, it's a complex and, and multidimensional and we don't know what's relevant. Uh, it would be good to have some sort of understanding what is our model? How much data we should collect? On how many contexts do we have statistical power to find the effects, and 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 so forth? So I think this is what what to me was like. Ever I agree with everything what's been said, but this element has been missing in this discussion. Yeah. Well, I wanted to make one comment about the sort of very high dimensionality of this sort of spatio-temporal context space we need to explore, which is that we do need to lean on both experimental and computational methods that can make that more efficient. So experimental methods, meaning village in a dish, multi-cell type cultures, including organoids, embryoid bodies, and others, um, you know, ways to explore multiple perturbations very efficiently. Um, and we also then need computational methods that can handle sort of deconvoluting these complex data, single cell, multi-cell type systems where, you know, in some cases, we're going to have to be inferring the context from the data itself that we're then thinking, you know, how does cell type or context modulate genetic effect. So we need development on the both experimental and computational side to make this plausible. Just to follow up on that, um, and there was a question in the chat that, that addresses this a little bit, or just is an interesting question. So are we going to be entering the realm of candidate environments here? And um, you know, maybe for tractability, this is something that we would have to do so we can learn, so we can learn, you know, which kinds of things are potentially yeah, learn patterns, right? As to where these contexts, you know. Um, features of, of context specific effects. But um, I think that's kind of an interesting question. Uh, Barbara, I see Michelle George with his hands up. So are we accepting, I know this is a panel, is it a closed panel or we invite questions from? Let's have some questions. Let's have questions. some questions. Yes, please. So maybe one context uh, that 
could be brought into the discussion. And, and so, so I think we all lose the, the GWAS for uh, disease predisposition, actually. So uh, we map genes or loci, which we think there's a perturbation there that is affecting the chance that you would develop the disease. And when we look at functional correlates through EQTL analysis, for a number of reasons, we study them into healthy individuals, which is nice because it's generic and you probably have less noise due to the disease process. In fact, it's, so a parenthesis is kind of interesting to, we all say in grounds that we do that because this will be interesting targets for the pharmaceutical industry, sort of an interesting logical leap to say that uh, you the, the mechanisms that determine whether you want to develop the disease can be targeted to reverse the disease process if you have it. I think that's sort of an interesting jump. But I think what is possible is that part of these effects that we see actually only come into play in the context of, let's say, an early disease. So uh, the, what we map can not only be what at least I thought I was initially mapping, that is things that are really uh, predisposition, but it, it could actually also be things which determine the course of the disease once it is initiated. And so I think one of the contexts that we should probably bring into the table when we look at these functional follow-ups is to actually take into account the disease process as a context. Yeah, well, I would agree with that. Um, panelists, anybody wanna follow up on that? Just with agreement that that's one of the, when we think about temporal context, the two that I always think about are development differentiation and then disease process. So yes, definitely. So I wanted to come back to a few things that were brought up by Aravinda and Brandon. When we think about age as a context, there's been beautiful work showing the importance of develop or early developmental um, sort of cells that we don't see again later. The, you know, the, the huge role that, that some of the autism genes play in early development, you, you really can capture that only if you're, you're looking at, at sort of genes expressed in fetal development. But, but a lot of our data really come from diseases where aging is, I mean, you know, they're diseases of, of later life, cardiovascular disease and cancer where the context may not be about cell type, but big biological processes like inflammatory biology and the sort of declining immune system biology that, that may make cancer more, you know, immune surveillance is failing, cancers are growing. The, the ways that inflammatory biology and brain biology talk to each other is also creepy. And, and I think one of Thule's questions on, is it gene function we need to understand or variant function? The, the, our, our ignorance of gene function is illustrated in so many ways over time. The same gene families end up with different names when a neurologist discovers them and when an immunologist discovers them, and they're clearly working um, the, the complexity of these systems in fine cell-cell communication is clearly a part of this that we that we don't capture well. Now. And I, so I, I think we have to think of the context as both. Yes, there are going to be really important cellular contexts, but there are going to be really important life contexts. That, it, that are about exposures, that are about, you know, the whole set of disease processes that we have. And, and then to come back to one of the things Aravinda said, we clean up debris from disease in complicated ways, proteins turn over, and that whole process probably contributes more to lots of diseases than we've appreciated. So we probably do have some good context candidates that we can probe better than we could probe before um, because we are learning more about those things. So, but we, we all got burned with candidate gene studies. So 
we probably need to think through the modeling of candidate um, exposures and candidate contexts um, going forward. Yes, I'd like. I, I would probably just reiterate what I, what I said following Nancy's comment is that if if there is a guideline or approach, this is how you approach context, right? So this is how many contexts you should do in a single experiment. This is how you analyze them jointly. This is how you figure out what is statistically significant. This is how you collect the data. This is the power requirements. So I think this is missing. This is completely missing in the field at this point. And, and uh, so, so we don't end up in the same candidate gene uh, situation uh, again. Um, I see Alkis has his hand up. Alkis, would you like to add? That? Yeah, I mean, as we think about this infinite dimensional space of possibly relevant, you know, a fine grain context at also environments. Uh, I mean, I don't have all the answers, but a couple of points here are that when it comes to contexts, we can, you know, probably uh, assay them in very small sample size. Uh, you know, kind of what Thule called the ENCODE style approach and try to get a sense of, of, you know, what is important when we integrate that with disease GWAS and then invest more resources in a more molecular QTL type analyses of those that seem to be important or important for a particular disease or trait. I might be stating the obvious here, but I think worth saying. And um, and in the in this, you know, in the world of environments, you know, we do have these amazing, you know, large biobanks or perhaps even larger, you know, EHR cohorts where we can certainly um, you know, get a sense of of which environmental variables are important for disease. And perhaps, not definitely, but probably those might be the ones where we might want to start to look into G by E for disease, or maybe G by E for expression, as in Francesca's talk. Thanks, Alkis. Um, Brandon, I see your hands up. <laughs> yeah, yeah, briefly and really in agreement with those comments. But I just wanted to challenge myself and all of us with the notion that the space of possibility environmentally is infinite and cannot be understood. I, I think I hear that a lot. And I, I, I think given give a disease, say for example, take, take the uterine cancer story that was so beautifully told uh, in this session. I mean, we have many, 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 many decades of kind of contextual and environmental things that actually do inform right disease progression in that disease. And that goes for many, many sort of diseases. So I think, I mean, I think part of the problem with the way I was trained, right, is that we have, I, I was not even trained to bother, right, to even think about that on the way into the problem, right? I was only taught to think about that on the opposite end of the problem after I have uncertainty around my inability to find uh, a main effect that I'm happy with. So I think there's a there, there's different ways to answer the this, these same sort of questions that I think shrink the space of environmental possibility into a tangible set of things that I think could be much much more responsibly get after some of these uh, questions. Um, and a question in the back, I see. Uh, Peter Fisher. Um, so. If we have an infinite number of environments and contexts, and context specificity is so important, then why is the correlation between relatives for traits so high? Like for identical twins, their correlation in liability to schizophrenia is about 0.7 or so. So I don't understand how this, this complexity suggests to me a lot of opportunities for noise, for stochasticity, and yet relatives are very for a lot of common diseases as well, or, or liability, are actually quite high in the correlation for the panel. Thank you. Uh, can, uh, can I answer this real quick? Uh, so I, I'm, I'm very sympathetic with the idea that uh, we know that H square and small H square, uh, we, 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 we can explain a lot of that with epidemiological studies and now with, with GWAS, right? So, so there, there, I think there are two separate questions. There is question of environment in the classical sense, uh, pollution, smoking, uh, I don't know, exercise and stuff like that. I think the reason this community is so obsessed with context in this session is, is not that, is molecular traits, is the inability of us to explain what we're seeing in GWAS and in explaining H small uh, square with uh, molecular data in hand. And, and that's a different question. And that question 
I don't know whether context is the right answer. But if, if I'm thinking about the context of the cell and the context of specific molecular interaction, uh, it, it, it differs from cell to cell. It doesn't differ from, uh, from individual to individual. So in, in the familial study, as you mentioned, are only um, answering the component of broad environment for organism, but, it, but don't uh, pinpoint to the molecular mechanism. So this is, I think this is the issue the context comes forward, not only the broad environment. Otherwise, I, I, I fully, well, at least I fully agree with, with what you said. Yeah, I think just to reiterate, one thing I've been thinking is that there are many contexts and environments that we all are exposed to. We all go through development and differentiation. We all have multiple cell types. We all are exposed to infection. These are still relevant potentially to you know, explaining heritability. I think I'm just going to quickly jump in. And I mean, in some sense, environment also has to be integrated into cell biology, right? So maybe, maybe it's actually not so, not so distinct from thinking how, you know, a thousand variants in, in 500 genes pull that cell biology. I mean, at the end of the day, maybe environment ends up doing the same thing, right? Just through signaling cascades. So, so, so maybe at the processes that matter, it, maybe it's not so distinct. I mean, Nancy brought up it, diseases of aging versus um, developmental disorders. Maybe those, obviously it's gonna be very different for different diseases, but I wouldn't be surprised if sometimes the way in which things break down at the cellular level are maybe actually the same. Okay. And just the difference is which cell it affects and when it happens, preventing it from, from pursuing its function, which then can, for development, of course, lead to all kinds of downstream effects. Um, so maybe there's sort of some hope there, right? That again, if, if we know what to integrate to and measure that, may, maybe that's where we need to be. And that can maybe also inform then the kinds of environments we wanna test, right? Because we know how to, uh, you know, stress certain cellular pathways to the exclusion of, of, of others or preferentially compared to others. Thank you. Alkes, would you like to weigh in? So if I understand correctly, uh, Peter's question was, if um, narrow sense heritability estimates from twin studies are so high, then in the context of disease and complex trait GWAS, how can G by E play such a major role? And my answer to that would be, we do have to be a little bit careful with these twin-based estimates. Uh, for example, the paper of Zuck et al. 2012, PNAS, showed that G by G interaction can inflate twin-based estimates, even though twin-based estimates are intended to be estimates of narrow sense heritability. And I would um, hypothesize that in the same way, G by E could inflate twin-based estimates, even though twin-based estimates are intended to be estimates of narrow sense heritability. And if you look at height, a trait we all you know, know and love, you know, for a long time, twin-based estimates came in at 0.8. And then we have some more recent estimates, Young et al. 2018 Nature Genetics using a polygenic TDT type test, which you don't have to agree with it, but the estimate came in at 0.55 with a tight error bar. Why is that so different from the twin-based estimates? One possible explanation is it could be G by E. Okay, we've got some questions in the back. Um, okay. Could come up here and ask if. Okay. Okay. Thank you. So, um, I think this possibility was raised in a couple of the talks, but I, I, I wonder if the panelists or others could comment on that. So there was this notion that maybe we have a certain hourglass type behavior where, um, many genetic effects of different kinds are, are kind of like a focused into specific mechanisms and pathways leading to specific diseases or categories of diseases or traits and so on. And then on the other hand, there was a lot of talk about context in the context of environments. And I'm wondering if we're expecting or what's the thoughts of whether the environmental effects go through the same hourglass That sounds a little bit like what you were just talking about, right? So asking whether the environmental effects also converge through a set of pathways or particular cellular readouts and, and something along those lines, you know, I think that's very likely if the disease processes are actually mediated at the cellular level, 
I mean, there was a comment from Thule that says the only environment the genome sees is, you know, what it sees in the nucleus. And to some extent, you know, if the disease is present at a cellular level, I think it is passing through the same pathways, gene regulatory networks, and sort of key um, changes that the genetic effects are passing through as well. You know, there is some, we haven't talked very much about like systems level. And when I say systems, I mean like organ system level effects, you know, hormones, et cetera. We haven't discussed that very much, but at the cellular level, I would say yes. Please, question. We've got a question. Two points, if I may. The the answer you, you just gave and, and earlier's comments that the environmental effects and the genetic effect should pass through the same pathways, it's positively embarrassing you don't know the answer. People have been studying the, how environmental effects affect uh, physiology and disease. Surely you should have had enough data to answer that question. Do they go through the same pathways or not? Does Arvind yeah, want to yeah. answer this? <laughs> no, I didn't do anything that would be embarrassing. <laughs> <laughs> so I'll, I was just thinking of two examples. I think there are many examples where we know the environmental effects act through the same thing. A classical example is the effects of thalidomide on, on embryopathies. Um, you know, the mechanism wasn't known. A few years ago, somebody showed it actually that the drug affects the same transcription factor that have mutants that create genetic copies. So it acts exactly through the same and explains a lot of other related facts with it. But the most common example is, for example, is, is oxygen metabolism. It affects the same network, okay? There are genetic mutations, the ones that, um, what's his name, I forget, anyway you know, who found, you know, common variants that lead to high altitude adaptations. And now the biochemistry has been figured out, you know, with HIF-1 alpha, they, they go through exactly the same pathways. And this is one of the broadest environments. So I think my earlier question of, I think it would make, it would be of some value to think of what we mean by environment, what we mean by context and trying to I'm, you know, not a museum collector, but try to classify so that we know how much of it we cover. Mm -hmm. So maybe some things we cover in great detail, others we. It would be useful to take very specific environmental facts and see whether they go through that same, meaning are the successes we know exceptions or are they really rules? I, I'd actually like someone to do a systematic analysis to say, you know, here's a something that's been well studied, here are all the uh, mechanisms we know from environmental studies, or, and here are the ones we know from genetics, and see how well they marry up. But if I could move on to a second point, Julie's last slide had a diagram showing uh, a cascade of effects from uh, low cellular level to even high, and the diagram could have been in a book on artificial intelligence showing the uh, way in which deep neural networks are, are used where they propagate a signal from one layer to another. Has, has anybody tried properly to use uh, artificial intelligence to integrate these different layers of, uh, of phenotype from you know gene expression through biochemistry to out on outside phenotype. I, I, uh, Michael, I'd like to comment first uh, to, to your earlier question uh, because my natural intelligence is not great enough to comment on the artificial intelligence question. Um, the um, the analog of hourglass that I don't see from here, I assume guys Sala brought up, is, is the this idea that there are disease-related pathway or phenotype-related pathway, environment affects them, genetics affects them, uh, there is some um, convergence on some mechanism, and if we target this mechanism, we can uh, we can cure disease. And I think what NASA stock demonstrated today 
the reality is, is very complex. And if we think about cancer, there is lung cancer. We know we want to do GWAS and figure out the pathway that causes cancer and how we target the pathway. The biggest hit in GWAS for lung cancer is nicotine receptor. That affects uh, how many cigarettes people smoke who do smoke, right? That's environment. That's a genetic predisposition to the environment. The effect of, the, of this environment is on mutagenesis. It's not on cancer progression. You cannot address a smoking behavior or even mutagenesis to cure individuals from cancer, right? So, so, so this mental models, I think this is the, the, the problem. We, we work with mental models in the space of ideas in the situation where all these effects are much more complex and outside the box. And as soon as you look at real genetics example in the Lyme disease example today, Right, it doesn't fit this uh, this simplistic mental models, and I think we just have to accept that. Uh, and I let the others respond to the about uh, uh, artificial intelligence. Yeah, I think we're just about out of time. Well, did you want to say something about artificial intelligence? I, I'll just say, you know, your question was, have people tried properly? So I would say people have tried. You could argue about whether it's proper. Um, you know, there's been a lot of uh, artificial intelligence applications on on the genetic sequence, there's been a lot of applications on modeling gene expression, but sort of the genetic variation and heritability part, I think is less well-developed. And I'd be happy to talk more about this when we have time, we're being cut off. Um, I believe there was one more question. Yeah, well, oops, there. sorry. So this is uh, Loic Yango, uh, University of Queensland. Uh, I'm just gonna make two quick comments. One is about Mike points, which I, I love to have a very provocative statement at the end. Uh, I guess the, your point is very related to some of the discussions we had about polygenicity. You know, when people think about people achieving the same polygenic scores with different combinations, and in a way, we're comfortable thinking that somehow those variants will converge in some similar pathways. And I, I don't think it's a big leap to think that the environment will do the same. But I agree that we we'll, we should be able to test that empirically. And secondly, my point about um, the, the dimensionality of the space of context and environment. Uh, I think it, it sounds very daunting, but you know, I was thinking that we've achieved similar, we've managed to answer a similar problem using uh, a concept like sleep heritability. We have been able to quantify how much information there, there is without actually uh, before identifying the specific variants. And I think we can achieve the same thing for that large um, uh, phenotypic space or context space. If we sample it large enough, we can, we can search it later. Okay, with that, we will stop. Thank you very much for your questions and thank all the panelists for their insights here. Thank you.